Welcome to Hurt at Sports Radio. Meanwhile, here at 14, we only saw 12 birdies combined in the first two rounds. This is Shane Lowry with his second, 118 to the hole. And Lowry with an eagle. The first eagle at 14 in eight years. I would say it certainly didn't help. That might help. That might help. Oh, can you believe it? Okay, a little back foot sandwich. Bump it short. Let it roll down. That's more like it, Max. Beautifully played. His stardom confirmed. I was a bit overwhelmed because I told him, I was like, I wish that I didn't want to win as badly as I did, or as badly as I do. I think it would make the mornings easier. But I, I love winning. I hate losing. I really do. And when you're here in the biggest moments, when I'm sitting there with the lead on Sunday, I really, really want to win badly. Good morning. Welcome into Hurt Out Sports Radio here on AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, as well as from the Pillar Exterior Stage. Heard a lot of golf in that intro there. there was there golf this weekend? I think there was a tournament that some people are uh, pretty tuned into. It did. I would say it certainly didn't help. No, it didn't help. It, it, it didn't help at all. A little all. anticlimactic on is, Sunday. Is that Dottie? Some of that is. That is, was Dottie. Some of that is, is old Scotty's personality. Yeah. I mean, he makes Dustin Johnson look squirrely. It's real even keeled. <laughs> yeah. Real, uh, you, know, you know, Dustin Johnson just, has the coolest walk on the tour. Just, ma- just <laughs> I mean, everything is okay for old DJ. And old Scheffler makes <laughs> Dustin Johnson look loosey-goosey. Yeah, it makes him look like Danny Hurley. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, 60 seconds that in we somehow, get a, we somehow get a hurley reference well you got to right well it's just you know the one that came to mind in yeah. terms of people that are a little unhinged but no it's uh it was a little, i love i've been listening to coach hurley and danny hurley a lot a little mm. anticlimactic on a sunday but you know the so old scotty had a little drama on saturday got to uh, had a little rough stretch there and then bounce right back well at least he showed you he was so they showed a bounce back stat what he does after he bogeys a hole? Well, because he had what? He had bogey, double bogey, and then another bogey within six, and, eight holes and, on Saturday. And his ability to, like, not let that. Yeah. Unlike we saw with Morikawa. Yeah. After eight yesterday, who never really recovered. No, because he was right there with him. Yeah, and it turned out to be a three-stroke lead, right? Mm-hmm. You went from tied. Scheffler rolled in the bird, mm-hmm. went to minus eight. And he, Colin had the little six footer coming back after the bad chip. Ooh, the sandy. Ooh, we, it's, it's a weird feeling when you see a pro at that level have a ball come right back to do their stuff feet. that we do. Yeah, and it's like, mm. and then you know he flew it a little long, and before you know it, it's a three stroke lead, mm-hmm. and you still have nine to play. But then Scheffler birdied nine and goes to nine under. And then you feel like, all right, I got to make a move. This dude is not going to make a mistake if I'm going to run him down. Or do you just play for second? Well, I think there's... Because he tried to, he tried to, he got aggressive. He Obviously, did, Colin did. Which I, I I appreciate, right? You don't really talk about a uh, killer instinct in golf that much. Mm-hmm. But it's something we talked about with Tiger because you just weren't running him down on a Sunday. And I, I think that's honestly a little bit what we saw from from Scheffler yesterday, where he saw the opening with uh, with Morikawa and Morikawa and just went from okay, tied one stroke lead to like okay, I've got an opportunity to to put my foot down on this guy's throat for a second here, and that kind of forced Colin to try and do some things that were probably. I mean, he said it in the in the post uh, post round. I always want to say post. in the cabin. I always want to say in the post game. It's not really, you know, but in the post round uh, kind of uh, interview where he just goes, "Yeah, I got greedy there." 
which, you know, I, I think he had to. Like, I, if, if you were going to try and win. I think the only thing that really made that interesting is if Homa could putt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe you're cheering for Ludwig. And which, uh, I mean, for a first major appearance, you incredible. Qui- you quietly were like, ooh, stay out of the water, stay out of the water, stay out of the water. You're like, oh, but he kind of recovered. But that was the stretch you thought he could maybe yes. make a little make, run. Yeah, make a little noise there. Yeah, uh, but I mean, a lot of that is just Scheffler's his personality. Like he makes it seem he caters to the whole uneventful thing, <laughs> doesn't he? <laughs> But like, if you're a competitor, just, you just want him, it. Wa- just him walking around, it's like, ah, this guy's got it under control. That's how you want it, though, right? You want it to be uneventful. Like, if you're in that, yeah, if you're si- him, if you're, not him if you're in- watching, yeah. no. But if you're him in that situation, yeah. I get it doesn't make for good TV. But if you're him in that situation, that's exactly how you want it to play out. Is you've got an opportunity, you seize the opportunity, and then it's just over, right? Like that's, I think other athletes would be thrilled if they had that level of ability to just close the door on somebody in that instance. So it's interesting. And you probably know this off the top of your head, just because I'm sure it came up, but, and I get it that the corn Ferry tour player of the year, Mm -hmm. uh, money list winner in the PGA for, I don't know how many years in a row, maybe three, three, I think Um, nine tour wins. I mean, some ridiculous stats, right? He Mm -hmm. was, he was plus 325 to win the thing next closest was a thousand which which remind me to come back to for a second yeah in a second but would you now maybe i'm being greedy okay but this is a little bit of the kepka kind of tiger maybe even rory to some degree not to say that i haven't seen this before but does scheffler does the talk and the heap of praise of scheffler and it's well earned does it fit the number of majors he's won? No, because it's just the two, right? And it's just at Augusta. And I say that knowing full well what I'm saying. Yeah. Not, not just Augusta or just two majors when you've only been on tour for Four, six years. Yeah. I think yeah. he's either 2017, 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it seem, does his prowess seem like, or is he just that consistent with the nine tour wins and the two majors? So one major twice. Yes. Does it seem like it fits the or because he's dominant? Yes. You know, it kind of. Am I? Is that? Are you understand what I'm saying? I 100 like, percent understand what you're saying, and I think it's Tiger's fault. I we, think for we've this, seen some other young gun runs like this in a six year stretch, though, with with two majors right with, one yes this, so with, it's like but i don't know how many have we seen with more than two and off the top of my head i don't know yeah you're probably right you're probably and may you know because he's got a couple i know he has a couple seconds he may have four second place finishes yeah. at, at majors he, and he's pretty much always top five so two so tie for two second twice he's got a tie for second twice um so maybe that's it but and I, Go ahead. In golf, you can make a great living getting second place. Oh, in golf, you can make so a one great of, living. One, one, of, one of Jack's gaudier statistics is the amount of times he finished second. Yeah. Like, I'm with you. Yeah. I, I'm with you. There's something yeah. to be said. Something for, to be said about getting second place. Especially there. now, you can make a great living just making cuts. Yeah. So he's you know, he's tied. He's been tied for second. Yeah. In the open and in. The Open and maybe both Opens. Maybe the Open and the U.S. Open. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I don't know, though. If you, if you, if you like, like you said, though, if you, it, do you play for just second? I mean, because that's that, that course PGA there. Championship, you type for second. That course there. I mean, if, if you go and you, and you try to, uh, you know, I mean, you kind of saw it on Saturday with, there was a little bit of drama on Saturday. You had tied, tied for eighth in the Open. You had five, six guys tied for first place at six, six under. Mm hmm. And You're those like, guys, oh, this is a pretty sweet leaderboard. Yeah, this is pretty sweet. Yeah. And, they, and, and they, then it thinned out like in a hurry. Early Sunday. And they like, tried oh, to start making moves. Fun. Yeah. And they tried to start making moves and it just crumbled on a lot of guys. So uh, what I was what I was going to ask you to come back to is we saw a lot of guys get the benefit of the doubt with the early odds. Mm-hmm. Right. The Spies, the McElroys. Uh, 
Yeah, there's a couple guys that that just that get the benefit because of name. the course, and we asked the name in the course. Yeah, we yeah. asked uh, who was our expert last week, Shane, that we always talked oh, to. Oh, uh, Ryan uh, Ballinger. Ballinger, yeah, yeah, right. Like, yeah, you know, because perhaps of of all the majors, you only play it once, and it's on the rotation every year. Like mm -hmm. familiarity with the course matters, but almost none of those guys played well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you they, had they a, got the benefit of the doubt. I mean, you had a half dozen guys that that didn't even make the cut that should have made the cut. Speed had the third highest odds going into that thing, fourth. And if you count the ties, like, yeah. there were a couple ten to ones, a couple eleven. To he was right there at twenty to one. Yeah, yeah. Which is Justin Thomas gets the benefit. Of, like some of these guys get the benefit of and the doubt. Some dot. of these guys haven't been Play, playing, playing well, well for a while. Yeah, stay away from Jordan. Don't right. Uh, don't I, I, so don't put your money on Jordan. <laughs> pre pretty much a cause for concern for Jordan. Yeah, yeah, because he's trying. He's been trying. He's, he's way in the wrong trend, direction. Trying in the wrong direction for a minute now. I just, I it's just interesting. Yeah, I was so I was trying to find Spieth's. Um, I was trying to find his master's result or his uh, major's results, not Spieth, uh, Scheffler's yeah. major's results, because I, I'm trying to. Well, I know a couple off the top, right? So like his, I, I know he's got the two, he's got the PGA championship. He tied for second, the open championship. He's tied for second. He tied for eighth. And um, which one am I missing? I said the other two. So uh, the U.S. PGA. Open, he was tied for second. The Open, so British, the British, yeah, he's tied for eighth. So PGA, and then so he's got two. He's got two top. Two, he's got top twos, and he's got top twos in the PGA and the U.S. Open. He's got a top ten in the Open, and he's won the Masters twice. Yeah, so I think part of it. So like last year, he went tenth, second, third in Masters, PGA, U.S. Open. Um, the year before 2022, he had first and he uh, tied for second in the U.S. Tied Open. for second, um, and then he had three top ten finishes in 2021. So it's the it's the consistency. So he had three top tens in 2020, which is the reason why he's been ranked number one for what 80 weeks in a row. Yeah, he had three top tens in 2023, three top tens in 2021, a top ten or top five in 2020, and then he's got the two wins. And so he's in the mix. Yeah, d does it fit though? The narrative, yeah, because we the top tens, you're like, oh yeah, like the consist. That's how you get to number one, yeah. But does it fit the way that we talk about it? Probably not. But it also, again, I blame Tiger for two things, right? You think it would be worse though with Tiger because Tiger was act. I mean, he was winning one out of every four starts. No, I know, but that that's why I like the. So it, it's not even it's not even that neighborhood. No. What I think part of it is, is when we look at major specifically, mm -hmm. we hold people subconsciously or consciously to sort of tiger standard of his rate of winning those majors, which is not anything that's probably ever going to be replicated in mm -hmm. our lives. So that's where one problem is when we're like, oh, he's only won two, you know, in his in his six years as a as a pro. And then but I mean, if you look at he's only actually started all four majors since 2021 i know so we're talking about in four three years and change he's gotten two majors already he's gotten two second places already and he's got uh oh, i'm going to take out 2020 because he didn't start all four he's got uh eight top tens uh or six six top tens right so the level at which he's playing is really really high and really not that long a period of time but here's the other problem where it's a tiger issue is how many majors did Spieth win in three years? Two. I need to look that up. But there's just some there's just some guys in recent history where I'm like, oh, I wonder if I'm afraid. So he won three in three years. Basically, yeah. he won. And, yeah. the, and and he won them dramatically yeah. too because he won the British. The, I mean, when those he are won the, the things. British, those are the, the he's the, the one. He's the one that got me to think about this question. So he won the he man. He almost won three. Listen to what I'm telling you. Yeah. Like he had a heck of a three year run. Yeah. So he almost won three in 2015. He won the Masters, won U.S. Open, and got second in the yeah. PGA. And then he won. Uh, and then he won in the open championship in 2017. So I'm like in, in my head, 
And I think we were like this, Shane, because you were with me. Weren't we like the wait and see thing? Because we were we got into the better than Rory talk at that time on Spieth with Spieth. Yeah. And, you know, we got it. We had these discussions where it was like, well, is anybody? But still, though, when Rory is going, nobody has the ability to lap the field. Like McElroy, and and he just came out of nowhere too. And we and we we like fell in love, and then, bam, we, we kind of we didn't really get with like this with Justin Thomas because he didn't wasn't the majors thing, but mm-hmm. the consistency for how good we all these guys were gonna be next. But Scheffler, I, I guess a, you know how many tour wins Spieth has since the Open Championship in twenty seventeen. Uh, I'll take a wins. guess. Tour wins. How many tour wins? Yeah. How many tour wins does Spieth have in the last seven years? Yep. Ooh. Four, six, eight, twelve. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of look alike, too. Is that McGuire? That's fine. Um, it's Dannon. Is it? Why do I get those two confused? Uh, they couldn't be further apart in eight. They kind of sound alike, though. Except Dannon would say, yes, sir. <laughs> um, it is not optional. Let's see. Neither is playing hard as a wide receiver for the young guy. Ooh, you better you better get after you it. You better get after it and find something else different to do. <laughs> uh, I'll go. How many tour? I hate to say none because seven years is a long time. But I'm gonna go with one, two. Okay, he's got two or two tour. So like the speed thing fell off in a hurry. Mm-hmm. He's got he had one in 2021. So he went four years without a win from 17 to 21. He won once in 2021. He won once in 2022. Hasn't won in two full years. So would the difference between Kepka, who's racked up a ton of majors, and uh Kepka, did Kepka have four and three? I'm checking. Uh yeah, double check that for me. Because where I'm going with this is so is so is Kepka. So maybe you don't even have to go back as far as Tiger. Maybe it's Brooks you go with because Brooks has kind of been this self-labeled, I don't care about the rest of the the events. I'm a majors guy. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why we skip over his run because he doesn't have the consistency that Scheffler has in the day-to-day because Scheffler's now up to nine. You want to hear the you want to hear the the crazy the craziest Brooks Kepka stat? I just, I like these because I didn't know we were going to go here. But do you know why I like what you're doing? Why? Because it kind of confirms what I think about the Scheffler talk. Because yeah. you're going to tell me something extraordinary. Yeah. So okay, he, go. He's got five majors mm-hmm. out of how many overall tour wins? Ooh, another good one. Since when? Give me the year. Lifetime. Ooh. His entire – he's got – Five tour. He's got five major wins. I'll go with. Come on, DB. Uh, this is going to sound crazy. I'm going to go with nine. It is exactly nine. Let's go. He's got nine tour wins. Five of them are major. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so maybe that's the difference. He's Because we've seen we've seen better major runs. Yes. 100%. We we haven't seen a ton of better just golf runs. Yeah. Like his actual because he's playing a lot. Scheffler plays way more than Kepka does. I think that's something that I like too. That he actually like goes he, out he, and plays. He plays. Yeah, he seems like he actually, you know, likes golf, which is a plus in, in his in his field of choice. But Kep <laughs> Kepka has gone. He went 2017 US Open, 2018 US Open, 2018 PGA Championship, 2019 PGA Championship. 2023 PGA Championship. Those are his five major wins. He's only got four other ones besides that. Two, yeah. of, two so of them I, are two of them are waste management. So the I just immediately started thinking. Okay, have we seen? We've definitely. What, what's seen, the? We've seen the majors run yeah. in that short of time. We haven't seen the consistency no. in just golf starts. Maybe and then you go. I although I I would. I would love to take a peek at maybe Rory. We'll give, we'll give Rory I, I a would, look. I'll give, I'll give Rory a look. I do in my head. Now, this was during some atrocious years for me. So this is like from, <laughs> I think, 2008 to 
to 2007 to 2012 where I wasn't paying much attention to anything other than myself. Not really in your sweet spot there. Um, like, I don't even want to guess. So Rory's weird. Okay. Because he hasn't won much in a while. No, I know. He, I don't think he's won a major since 14. Um, right? Yes. Okay, so he hasn't won a major since 14, but he was the second or third highest favorites to win the Masters this year. Well, because he still plays no. reasonably well. No, I understand. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and, and he's one of those guys that typically in on weekends when there isn't a ton of pressure, he'll all of a sudden backdoor this thing into like a top 10 finish, and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> Rory's got it. You know? you know, the funny thing about Rory and the Masters, though, is he's never actually won. Oh, 100%. Like, that's the weird. It's weird that he gets as much credit as he as he does for the Masters. Wasn't he Wasn't he 10 to 1? Yeah. He Rory was, was 10 to 1. He was up there. Two guys not to put money on, Jordan and Rory. <laughs> right? Don't do it. Because Don't do it. Be, but he's, his best finish was second, which was actually just two years ago. Mm -hmm. The best he's ever finished. But he's never, like... So he's got four majors, but they're all from 2011 to 2014. Mm. So he goes 2011 U.S. Open, 2012 PGA Championship, 2014 P PGA Championship, 2014 British Open. And that's it. It's been a decade. Mm. My dude has not won a ma a major so is in it, a decade. Do you feel comfortable? But he wins like two or three tournaments every year. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable? by getting on the Scheffler train? Or are you just going to enjoy this sample size for what it is? So I guess... I kind of feel comfortable because I like his demeanor. What's the what's the train, though? Like, how, like what am I signing well, we're, up we're for? Well, we're kind of... Listen to how he's talked about. No, you were anointing him for sure. But that's the other place where I blame Tiger. It's kind of the Michael Jordan effect where we're always like, oh... Looking for the next? Yeah, who's the next guy that's going to go on this crazy run? You know what's really hard to do? As we've seen by all the guys we've just looked up, do it for more than a couple years in a row. Yeah, well, the easy thing to do is how about that pitching matchup with Reagan the other day? Yeah, with Mets. Uh, was that a two-one final? I think so. Um, what did I tell you about my guy Reagan? No, I get it. <laughs> I get it. And he's still got to deal with Seth Lugo and Brady Singer in his own rotation. Uh, although Lugo, I'm not sure he can keep that up. But um, go Royals. No, not really. <laughs> Uh, what did you just say? About... Uh, we're talking about like, oh, so you know why? So you know, so you know why? Because it made yeah. me. Th it made me. By the way, you were low on the purse. You were giving the analogy of Natasha saying, "Like, okay, peace out. I got yeah. friends." And you're like, "Robbie, I want you to be here for me." And you're like, "Babe, do you know how much the purse is?" Yeah, I think you said two mil. Uh, I think it's like... it's 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 three six. Yeah, I was sad. That was just under four. It's it's, the... it's it's which is <laughs> a tiny purse. It's it's three six, yeah. right? But that's a really <laughs> like for the tournaments. That's a really small purse. And which they're with sponsorships and all the 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 endorsements. Mm -hmm. There's so many other distractions for golfers. Like just grinding every day, showing up for different events. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard for these young guys to want to do for more than two, three years in a row. Yeah, don't you think? Which you're is, you're not going to get a guy like Tiger. Maybe again. the most like how could you just grind? The, how could you just grind like that with all that's out there? For it'd be hard to do four years in a row, five years in Much a row. Much less Tiger did it for what a decade, basically. Before the I mean, unless you're off. like Happy Gilmore, you just love collecting checks to buy your mom's house back. <laughs> it's like maybe that's the key. The novelty checks keep people uh, keep people happy. That's it. We need more novelty checks in golf. Uh, coming up next, we'll set up the show. We'll have more Herd on Sports Radio. We will be back. We'll be back.
we will be back. Scotty Scheffler putter back and in is the Masters champion. Scotty Scheffler putter is the Masters champion. We will be back. We will be back. We will be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. Scotty Scheffler putter back and in. Scotty, Scotty, he's done it again. Scotty Scheffler for the second time in three years is the Masters champion. We're back here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, and YouTube here at the Hurt at Sports Bar and Grill. On the pillar exterior stage, that's DB. I'm Ravi Lula, and uh, you know I we were getting into Masters a little bit there. I I was a little. I mean, I was happy for Scheffler that he was one and didn't have to worry about the wife thing. There was a part of me that wanted him to have to make the decision because <laughs> I'm because I'm a jerk. I I wonder what the total purse was from the books of because you know I was driving down to. Mike and I went to, well, he rode with me mm -hmm. to Lincoln on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And I was, listen, I can't remember what we actually found on the radio. For the longest, 590 wasn't coming in. Mm. It was just static. I was like, what is going on? Which is weird because usually you can get 590 all the way out. Yeah, but it was it. nothing. So I knew it was kind of a thing. Yeah. And, it was like a technical issue. I was in Caleb's car. So I was like, oh, maybe it's this dumb car. Yeah. But no, it was. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a technical <laughs> issue because I can't figure out anything in his car. But and it's not even that fancy. It's just because it's not mine. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't know how to. You get really used to where everything is. Yeah. And, and I didn't want to be driving and messing with it. So I'm trying to have, you know, Mike help me figure it out. And I can't remember what we settled on the actual show. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a lot about 
golf and the four guys on the panel he was like espn vet or something like that because it was an espn it was a espn they they have like four on satellite or whatever Mm -hmm. and uh most of the guys tickets they all had like four or five tickets left because this was heading into the weekend right yeah and most of them in some way shape or form had scheffler involved yeah so and i imagine that was the majority of the action Although my guy JB and Ken, he likes Zal Torres the whole time. That's kind of been his guy. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he had him as a in a top ten as a ticket because he did finish in the Scheffler top. or uh, no Zal Torres. Yeah, because yeah. uh, yeah. I think he finished even. Was he tenth? I, I wonder if JB. So. I'm gonna have to ask him. It's uh, my man, my man JB and Casey. Will Zal Torres was tied for ninth. So yeah, yeah, he's a t- yeah. So I wonder if he had uh, a top ten ticket, but it's just uh, again another one of those guys that gets the benefit of the doubt. Yeah uh with with that course but um a lot of guys had scheffler tickets yeah i think vegas might take a little bath there i don't know though because isn't golf one of those things where you like to find you get a little you you get a little although so they said this it's funny you use that word so they said this and i was like how is plus 325 not value anytime you get good plus money yeah there's value now maybe you're pitting it against the field yeah that's yeah that's fine though that's fine yeah i get it but even when you're that prohibitive of a fave and you're still getting three to one on your money is anybody not doing a deal getting three to one on their money no i mean it's that's yeah maybe it's not as good as 20 to one but it's good value like what do you mean well i mean you know this goes to the old saying that uh comparison is the thief of joy comparison also can be the thief of your money (laughs) If you comparison look, is the thief of joy, that is two trillion percent true, right? But so you're looking at Scotty Scheffler at plus 325, and you don't look at it as oh, oh I'm only getting three to one on my yeah, money. You don't look at it as I can go three to one on my money. What you look at it as go, oh, well, the second place guy, I get 10 to one on my money. Yeah, that's what you you don't look at it in you're like, I get 700 percent more of my money if the second. If the second favorite wins, that's how people look at it. I wonder what happened on Saturday mornings with the gates. Uh, and because one of the guys that I bet was kind of hot was Homa, but he hates closing time, mm-hmm. right? Like he is not and, Sonic. And, and, and ev- inevitably the putter, uh, the, the little that stick's going to get him. But I bet you a lot of action was on Mar- Markara. Oh, probably. Right, because he's right there. Yeah, he's in the mix, but you, he's not going to have the really low odds. You know, so I, I, so maybe that was a shift. Yeah, I could see that. Um, but I, I don't know about taking a, a bath. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't. I would I guess, guess we wait for, for the final tickets to come in. I cash. suppose, but I, I would imagine that a lot of casual fans would have put their money on Scheffler, and yeah. that's usually where usually when. Your uneducated public money hits. That's where Vegas takes a bath, typically. Yeah. Now, golf is probably a little different because you have so many different people to spread your money across. Mm-hmm. They may never truly, quote unquote, take a bath on golf. But if this were any other sport where the public money was heavy on someone, you probably end up not having a great day if you're Vegas. But um, we will finish up our Masters talk as we. Uh, wrap up the show later we've got john rathaus yeah, his, his career earnings man he's almost Who's 60 chef? mil yeah he's won 40 this year because he's won two they have a couple like signature events every year that are 20 mil a pop and he's won two of those this year and, and man hmm. that's just a, that's a nice that's just a nice weekend's worth of work for 20 million dollars <laughs> um <laughs> And I know, oh, he's been working his whole life. Where I get it, guys. And I'm didn't he have a joke. didn't he have a good showing at the TPC earlier this year? He too? has very few poor showings. I think the TPC was one of the signature wins yeah. that he got. That was yeah. one of the twenty million dollar. Um, but we'll talk to John Rathaus. He's a former caddy on the tour. He is currently host of the Quiet Please podcast on the Herd at Sports Network. Shh. If you need a uh, oh, if you need a if you need a golf podcast, to oh, listen to Quiet Please. Um, we've <laughs> we'll wrap up the show with him. So we'll wrap up our masters conversation at that point as well but coming up here at eight o'clock we've got sam McEwen like we always do on monday morning from the omaha world herald 8 30 we've got laura bird kuhn the head coach of your omaha supernovas at nine one stephen montgomery sipple from husker online need to be careful here oh oh oh, oh, oh i don't know need to be careful uh (laughs) we 
love sip. Uh, he'll be joining us at nine. So that's what we've got coming up on the show. But as you Man, mentioned, that dirt looks amazing. Exactly. Sip. you never know what you're going to get out of him. Um, you mentioned Nebraska had a little scrimmage this weekend. They did. And we know we got like a 20 second clip on uh, on Twitter. What was it? Uh, mostly passing. Was it? OK. Yeah, it was mostly and it was all three guys. A uh, couple dimes from Heinrich. Which is about right. Couple, couple nice throws from all three guys. Basically, right. So yeah, was so, the twenty seconds. So if I had to, if I had to surmise it, that's about right. Every, all three guys had yeah. a pretty good day. Yeah, and I think I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna leave it right here, and I'm gonna move on. Okay. Can't promise I'll move on, but you can. Um. I think any body that said let like will see something or has been somewhere that just talks about one quarterback mm -hmm. is not accurate. Don't listen to anyone that says quarterback X was clearly this, quarterback Y dominated this. Listen, I have yet to see that. And I'm not saying I'm always going to be right, mm -hmm. but I do know that much. I, like, And you have a better idea of what you're talking about than most people who are looking So at I stuff. would stay away from the superlative – Hyperbole. So because it's 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 been a it's it's been a mixed bag. Let me take. I, I could see taking bits and pieces from. It's been a mixed bag, and now I, I'm to the point where I, I I can trend. Right. It's not okay. Right. It's not one this or one that or. Let me ask. It's it's, it's multiple upon multiple. Let me ask a question, and if you don't feel like answering, that's fine, and I'll move on. At this point, could you envision any of the three guys starting? Any? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's all you need to know. Yes. In terms I, of how it's gone so far. I could. And I could see the I could see the I could see the the rationale if they tried to spin's a bad word, if they tried to explain it that way. Yeah. Okay. That's all I want. I mean, so that's the explanation. Uh, or that's all you need to know in terms of when you say like if the season started tomorrow, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, if we if 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 the if the eight or ten practices, whatever it's been, is one, I think eight is all we've had to go on. Yeah, then any of those three guys could start at quarterback. One hundred. I I could see them making the case for any of the aforementioned. There you go. So okay. that's that's what you that's what you need to know so far about the quarterback position. What I do want to ask, we only have about a minute here, so maybe we'll carry this over into the next segment. I do want to ask you. What, who, I guess, who hmm? has surprised you the most compared to what you thought of them coming in? Huh. Um, it's a random. There's a random guy mm -hmm. or a random question? Random guy. Okay. Probably Ramirez Stewart. Oh, okay. DB. That that is a random guy. <laughs> well, I mean, just how you frame the question, yeah. right? Like, no, from, that's fair. From what I thought, go to what? I, yeah, I would say, I would say, Ramirez Stewart. Okay, uh, we will. I've got a follow. Not, I'm no fun, am I? That's why I just, I, I just pay attention to other things. No, but I like to hear, <laughs> you know, because nobody else is talking about Ramirez Stewart this morning. <laughs> um, I. I have a follow-up question to that, and then I have a, a couple other questions, and we'll see how much you, you want to answer. Probably, uh, not, probably none. That's fine. We'll, we'll see what we can do anyway. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. More here on Sports Radio coming up next. We will be back.
we will be back. We will be back. I try not to to think about the past or the future too much. I, I love trying to live in the present. I've had a really good start to the year, and I hope that I can continue on this, this path that I'm on. I'm going to continue to... We will be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. Wrapping up hour number one here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We're here at the Hurt at Sports Bar and Grill on the Pillar Exterior Stage. I want to remind you about our friends at the Omaha Supernovas. They will be back in action on Saturday here at home. You can go get tickets. That's at the CHI Health Center, 6 p.m. for a serve against the San Diego Mojo. Go ahead and go to supernovas.com for your tickets. You can go check out the Omaha Supernovas just a few home games left in the regular season so make sure you go out and support omaha's professional volleyball franchise at supernovas.com uh db yes sir we were talking about uh some some surprises some guys that uh surprised you the most you gave me ramir stewart i did he just kind of came out of nowhere you know nobody talks about him much uh, and the coach it just he just kind of flashed i like um I don't know. Yeah, I, I just there were some things that he's a very willing tackler. Okay. So I, I like I like, I like that. Yeah. Guys like to stick their nose in there a little bit. Yep. That's um, that's a good term. So uh kind of related ish uh question there. 
who has been exactly who you thought they were? To the good or to the bad? Either way. Um, Let's give one of each. No. I'll either just, way. Either way. Okay. <laughs> Why would I do that? Well, I don't know. I've got to give it a <laughs> shot. <laughs> Jeez. Um, exactly who I thought. Like you came in with a preconceived notion about someone. Uh, justified or not. And they've been right exactly where you expected them to be. Jalen Lloyd. Okay. I know that one's for the good. It doesn't. <laughs> it is. You've been very pleased with how Jalen. You, you said that you thought he was going to be with the top three guys this year. Uh, I, I got one for you, Mr. Know it all. Here's another one. You yeah. ready? Yeah. Dylan Rayola. I have no idea what that one means. <laughs> now, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> two, two people that are ex- exactly who I thought they were. Okay. I know. I I just know you're very high on Jalen Lloyd. Well, and so, and here's the thing with, with, with whatever evaluations are like my, my frame of reference and my starting point Mm -hmm. typically has things to do with things you cannot see. Yeah. With how they operate. Right. Right. I I was just talking to, to one guy on Saturday about, and I've said this publicly to about building a division one athlete. I was talking to one of the parents of a, of a young player. Okay. Huge, huge fan of this particular individual. And it took me about three minutes to get to anything physical about him. Sure. It's just the way, and this is the first time I've ever met these parents. Mindset ways wired. He um, operates. Yeah. And things that I can have, appreciate too because they have a younger son there's just a lot that i gravitate towards Mm -hmm. if i can learn something so i i want to know like if i see somebody uh, a guy or a gal doing something at a a high level i want to know where that came from right Mm -hmm. like ooh, i wonder what the whole nature versus nurture thing was so sometimes i'm not afraid i'll be nosy i'll ask questions (laughs) hey you know growing like i'm totally yeah especially i'm only good in those situations when like you have to almost be a stranger. I'm better with strangers than with people you know than with people I know. Yeah, because it's easier. I think it's easier to ask things of strangers because you don't actually care what their reaction is in terms of like I'm literally fact finding. Yeah, you're just tra- or you're just... or or being complimentary in, yeah. in this in in this instance. But generally, when you're talking about somebody you know. You're usually not you, just the royal you of people in general are worried about or at least cognizant about how someone might react to what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Whereas when it's with it's strangers, yeah. you're like, well, I may never talk to this person again. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Although sometimes you, you, you first impressions will creep up on you. Like, sure. You know, you'll leave and you're like, yeah, I bet they thought I was a total weirdo, <laughs> you know, or something like that. But it, it's I OK because I'm secu- like I've learned to kind of to, to deal with. Uh, people are going to think what they want. So I'm glad you brought that up because Coach Rule said something on Thursday that's kind of been like eating at my brain a little bit here. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it was like, it, it's funny when these things land on your. I love listening, I've been listening to Coach Hurley and Danny Hurley a lot. It wasn't that Shane. <laughs> um, it's just the lowlights. It he and I think it was kind of a throwaway line, but throw away in that nobody else paid attention to it. Not that he didn't mean to say. Oh, uh, where are you going to take this one? So he says, he, he said, kids need, need adversity to spur them on to drive them, right? And, and it was part of a bigger answer, right? But that really, that started setting off alarm bells in my head, right? Because there's two things that I firmly believe. Say, what, say, say that again. Kids need adversity to spur them on to drive them. Mm-hmm. So there's two things that I firmly you, believe. First of all, do you believe that? Yes. Okay. But... There are, I'm going to, I'm going to get to this. I do think there are guardrails that kind of need, like, I think structured adversity or like monitored adversity is generally the best. But so the reason I, one of the reasons that it's kind of set off alarm bells in my head is because there's a thing that I say sometimes when I meet adults that I don't think function at a real high level. And I, it's, it's kind of a messed up thing to say, but I go, uh, that person didn't have enough trauma when they were a kid. Mm. So but my equivalent, mm-hmm. they weren't touched enough as a child. Yeah. Like I, I like you, you didn't get enough discipline 
Yeah. Is is what is what I is how I like to work. And I don't even know like I don't even think of it in terms of like discipline. I it's do. just like you didn't have enough bad things happen to you that you had to overcome mm-hmm. in order to be functional so, as an adult. I'm, I'm vibing. Right? Yep. Keep going. But and so then I go from there, I go from coach rule to this thing that I sort of say snarkily about people that I don't think are functioning at a real high level to there's this Malcolm Gladwell book called David versus Goliath. And he talks about the Blitzkrieg of London in the 40s mm-hmm. and the difference between near misses and remote misses. And that's why I talked about the guardrails on the adversity, right? Because a remote miss in that context of, of London in the 40s when they were getting bombed by, by the Germans was you were aware of what was happening. Like the, the bombs were close enough to kind of shake your house, maybe break your windows. And like it was a scary situation. but like you were fine, your family was fine. It was scary, but you got through it. You got out of it, right? Mm-hmm. Then there's near misses, where maybe the house next to you got blown up, maybe your house got blown up, maybe you lost a family member, right? The people and there's study. There's been decades of study on this. The remote miss people end up functioning at a remarkably high level. Mm-hmm. The near miss people had too much trauma. And they end up struggling really badly in general. So there's that's where I say like the guardrails to the adversity because you need enough adversity to become a remote miss person. But if you get too much adversity, you become a near miss person where the trauma overtakes you. Yeah. And so I agree 100 percent. Kids need adversity to be able to function at a high level and to drive them and to move them. But there is a breaking point, right? Not to go another Malcolm Gladwell, but there's a tipping point, right? Where if you get too much of the adversity, it kind of ruins you yeah. or it can ruin most people. And I've been I've literally been thinking about that for four days. So I am in complete agreement with that. I don't think it was a throwaway line. I think it was in it goes along in the grand scheme of things. Because mm-hmm. This is funny. And, and I'll, I'll get, I won't even use the players, mm-hmm. but then I'll, I'll use maybe I won't use his name, but I'll tell you a particular story real quick the cliff notes version of a guy that is a freshman this year coming on campus mm-hmm. so yeah i agree with that 100 percent because what i say about the coaches the coaches clinic and taking it down to the wire and having to be accommodating doesn't seem it seems like kind of a non issue mm-hmm. right oh big deal man they had x amount of coaches no but it's the figure it out mindset that's the thing mm-hmm. so and i and i said this real time i go that is such a microcosm of how he wants his staff to function mm-hmm. Right. Like it's not always it's not always going to go the way you want it to. And what are you doing in the meantime if if the variables get to be too varied when you're not controlling the controllables? Like, how do you function? Mm-hmm. Like, what are some real life things? Mm-hmm. And and I think the practical application was that when he would tell that staff, sports staff, hey, man, figure it out. And it was stressful. And I think that's those. Are, but he's got you, though, like. Mm-hmm. The guardrails there are him and the the that staff. All right. Up to a certain point, you got to go figure it out. If it gets to be too crazy, hey, man, come back and see me. But right now, let's do, do your job. Mm-hmm. You, I trust you. This is what I hired you to do. Those are the guardrails. Same as a player. Uh, you know, a, a player may... Okay, uh, you know, a player may not want to show up for practice early in the morning. Mm-hmm. Hey, I had study table this. I had to do this. I was up late. Hey, all that's cool. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that. This is the second time you called me. It's too short a notice. I need you at practice. Everybody else isn't changing because you may be a little bit tired. I'm not not validating your feelings. Mm-hmm. I'm just not giving in to what you think the end result should be. I understand you were up late. Mm-hmm. Study table got you. You know, you got to present. Show up to practice anyway. Yep. Everybody else is counting on you. And guess what? The next time you go through this and you, you get through it, and we'll talk at 11 a day after practice is over, you'll know that you're better for coming to practice. Because you know you can do it. And now that you can do it, mm-hmm. it, it you, you can repeat that, even though it, it's kind of the remote thing. It's You're fine. Mm-hmm. You're, you're a little... You're a little shaken up yeah. by it. You're a little overwhelmed by it. But the guard but you're actually is, fine. 
what's our culture? This is me supporting you, giving you words of affirmation. And I've dangled the carrot because if you come out of the back end, you won't mind the darkness in the meantime. And you'll be better for it. In the long run. Sam McEwen coming up next. We will be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. Here is the sports editor for the Omaha World Herald, Sam McEwen. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Sam McEwen. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to throw the ball. And you just stand back there and throw it where you want to go. You know, that kind of thing. Sam McEwen. Are you guys going? Um, sure. Now, Sam McEwen. Kicking off hour number two here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN 
Tri-Cities, live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube from the Pillar Exterior Stage. SDB, I'm Robbie Lula. We're joined now by Sam McEwen on the Herd at Hotline. Sam, how are you this morning? I'm great. How are you guys today? Sam, what's up, man? You on the move or are you a little stationary? I am stationary this morning. Nice. Nice. Got got it In all handled. Uh, yeah. so, so the Durham Museum, huh? that was... Uh, I, I yeah. caught that. Very, very nice. Now it makes sense about the the replicating and can't be replicated thing again. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you for that. Um it was a it was a really good time and we like the team that we put together. Uh and yeah, it was uh it was good. It's yeah, you know, I think that team's gonna end up doing a lot of good things in college too. And so uh, you know, I think I think we had a good time putting it together. Sam, as we get about what two weeks away now from not even two weeks away now from the spring game. They've got a scrimmage yeah. under their belt as well. Um, is there, as you, from what you've heard and from what you've seen, which I know is, is limited to certain extents. Um, is there a position group that you find is the most competitive on the team? Good mm. question. Mm. Uh, I think it's going to be, I mean, I think I think when you use the word competitive, hmm. you could you could mean a couple of different things. So I think they feel very good that they're going to play quite a few defensive linemen. I don't know that I would describe that as competitive. I think it's probably more cooperative than competitive. Hmm. But I think they're going to play a lot of defensive linemen. I think it's harder to play more offensive linemen because, you know, defensive linemen, you can get them in there for nine snaps. That's not as always as easy with the offensive line. And so I think there's there's certainly good competition there for who's going to be on that front line, offensive line, especially interior. Um, you know, so there's some interesting competition there. There's nothing settled at running back. Not really. I mean, I I don't think there's anything finalized. Gabe Irvin is, is still going to get a, a chance at the job, and he's not – really you know he hasn't done i think a ton and so you've got a bunch of guys there where you're where you're looking at things and then you know like in terms of nature of competition the, there's a lot of quarterback i think everybody feels like Dylan rail is going to emerge from that group but everybody's getting an opportunity you know so like competition can be defined a lot of different ways linebacker i think there's competition there so like i think there you can define it a lot of different ways but you know there's there's competition all over the field for for that team right now. Hey, okay, so that got me thinking. That's actually that's that's a good question. I like the way you kind of frame that, and the answer was good, especially with D line. I think that's spot on. Mm -hmm. Like the the whole competitive thing versus cooperative is 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 a fantastic it's a good distinction. Is a fantastic line of demarcation. Let me ask you this way though: Is there a position group? And you can count corners different than safeties. You can keep the second level guys the same. Whatever you want to do to quantify the grouping, even if you want to use wide receivers and tight ends, although maybe you want to separate those guys. Um, who? What position group do you feel like the bottom is as close to mm. the top when you're looking at position groups? That's a good question. Well, I mean... It, you know, again, yeah, you define it by are you going all the when you when you go all the way to the bottom, are you going to walk ons? Are you going to you can um, uh, like you can keep it scholarship guys if you want. Although there's a quarterback. Couple. Okay. Quarterback. Now is yeah, now yeah, would I, now if I, you're I, right, I, wouldn't that be just think about what you just said. What what yeah. if what if you end up being right? Well, I mean, there's no way that I, I find it hard to give any other answer before two of the before Dylan Rayola plays a defense. Like, how do you, how do you know? Like, how do you know? No, I don't think you know. No. Oh, I, I could see. Okay. The game is played. Okay. Like, I don't think how how can you be so certain? Like, okay. and that's the part I'm trying. I feel like what you're going to have happen because people have to create and sort of manufacture stories is you're going to see people really build him up without having any idea what, what he's done in practice. We're going to watch a spring game. He's probably going to do some good things in that game, and we're going to like what he does, and people are going to run with it. And we don't know. We just don't know. And he could be Adrian Martinez, who had, I thought, a very nice through freshman year. Uh, it, could be, it could be more difficult than that. But the question, like, we, we can't answer that question until they actually play the games. Do I think he's going to be pretty good? I do. 
but I don't think it's fair to put a lot of undue pressure on them. So I would say that the, that the, the bunching is close there because, you know, do I think that Dylan, yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be pretty good. I think Danny Kalen could probably go up and do some good things, you know, so probably that area, but it's, but if we remove that, area from the group because it's we, weird because we there's only one quarterback and he wasn't even mentioned that has a conference win <laughs> right or any starts at all right. <laughs> I, right. I i get it that's that's a pretty i like how you frame the answer because it's you almost can't debate it like there's right. there's very little pushback given the right. if you start with the supposition of you know, we don't know what we don't know what Rio is going to be. We don't even really know. So short of fabricating what we want it to look like, that has to be the answer. Right. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a tricky answer. Um, if, if we're going if we're going with the scholarship players and we're just kind of looking at that, I think that where their running back competition is right now, you would you would almost say you've got five or six guys all competing, and so you've got Quit Knives. You've got Dante Dowdell, you've got Irvin who's banged up, you have Amir Johnson, you have Emma Johnson. And I think at this point, any four or five of those guys could play. It's a lot like 2021 when Ramir Johnson had merged by midseason, but in reality, they, they cycled through three or four starters before they got to him. If you remember that season, they had Gabe Irvin, they had Marquis Steph, they had Jock Yant. They ended up with Ramir Johnson, but that's not where they started. They had Sevion Morrison. He was the number two guy for a while. I, 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 and I use the right word here, fear that that could happen again. They've got to find a way to get two or three guys who are really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I wrote about the NIL thing this morning with Ohio State is, Ohio State has, you know, two of the, I don't know, six or seven best running backs in the country. And one of them they had to buy. You know, and that would be um, Junkins. Yeah, he's good. He's a really good player. And he chose to go to Ohio State and, and share carry. It, it's not going to affect his NFL draft stock. If he had gone to Nebraska, he would not have been dinged because he went to Nebraska by the NFL scout. He's already, you know, put on tape what he's going to be. He just can't go to the NFL yet because they have a rule. And so – what do you choose to do for that final year that you're you're in school? You're not going to win the Heisman at Ohio State because you're going to share carries with one guy, with another guy, and maybe two guys. And so you go there because they're willing to pay you to be there. Oh. So he's going to run for, I don't know, 900, 850, 900 yards this year, and he's going to make 2 or $3 million to do it. And and the challenge that Nebraska has, especially in this in this upcoming reality that we're going to be in, does Nebraska have enough money to go buy a guy like that? Or can they find in the recruiting process the guy that's worth that much money and then they retain him for maybe less than it costs to go out and buy the free agent college running back? Because Dudkins could help any team in the Big Ten, and he's going to the one team that didn't need him because of money. <laughs> hey, let me ask you something, Sam. How do you – um? And this is for either one of you. How do you differentiate, like, if, if the bottom is close to the top, right, which is kind of like the basic premise of socialism, and nobody's enamored with social, socialism, right. um, how do you not settle on or arrive at, well, if there's not a clear-cut this, then it says this about the group, right? Like, almost an indictment. Like, if, because I think sometimes that's how we feel about the running backs, right? Like, oh, there's no separator, so therefore the position group mm -hmm. isn't very good. All, and it could be something like, well, if everybody's about the same, that could be good as a whole. Like, how do you discern, regardless of the position? Because you may say the same thing about wide receivers. You may say the same thing about tight ends. Like, do you need a difference maker, or do you want quality of depth? And, and what's, what's the magic... <laughs> What's the magic marker where you go from, oh, it's just a, it's a lot of good guys, but no great to, man, that position group is really strong because there's no drop-off? Good question. I think that, uh, again, you know, referring to the time when you were at Nebraska, um, you, you, what you want is a bunch of different makers, you know, who are, um, you know, it's a deep group. And you got four or five guys that could be all conference. They just all happen to play for the same team. The challenge today 
is that's less likely to happen in the NIL era. They're going to, you know, players are going to spread out unless you have enough money like Ohio State to make it happen. And so, you know, what you really would love to see for Nebraska is, is a player who emerges who's really, really good. And then, as Matt Rule talked about last week, a guy stands out and then he brings somebody along with him. There's a player on the, on the roster who elevates his play in order to match the guy who's, you know, broken free. The challenge that I think Nebraska's had is for a variety of reasons, whether it's injuries or other things, they have not been able to have a player at that position who's really broken free uh, for a couple of years. And I know they hope that Gabe Irvin would be that. He got hurt. That's unfortunate. Um, but, you know, he got hurt. So they didn't have that separator last year. I thought Emmett Johnson was pretty good, but I don't think he was, you know, great. And, uh, you know, so you have these, this is, this is where things are at. Like, I think you want to have difference makers at the position. Simultaneously, you want to have depth. And, and, and I feel like Nebraska has some depth, but I don't know that they have an elite player. You know, they might have a, they might have an elite player at receiver before they have an elite player at running back. And so I guess we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I just would like, I think everybody would like to see that running back position get back to where it had long been which is a separator for Nebraska football for, I don't know, 30 years. And, and it hasn't been since, probably since Amir Abula left the building. We're talking with Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Sam, do you think a position can separate Nebraska without anyone at that position really separating themselves? Like if everybody in the running back room is going for, I don't know, 4.4 yards per carry pretty consistently, but nobody looks mm-hmm. like that one guy that, you know, is going to show up on a Doak Walker watch list or whatever, right? Nobody's going for a thousand yards, just a bunch of dudes that have good yards per carry and all rush for five to 700 yards. Can can both of those things be true at the same time? Uh, If you had three guys rushing for 700 yards, you'd 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 have a pretty good year. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But can you have a group that separates without a guy separating within that group? I don't know. I mean, I suppose you can, but I don't know that that's the, the scenario that Nebraska finds itself in now. So, yeah, like George, Georgia has good backs. Again, we're talking like if the question you asked, I'll, I'll give you an answer. And the answer is it's possible, mm. but it's possible among teams that are a hell of a lot better than Nebraska's back. And so for Nebraska to get to that level, Nebraska has to like get more players who are really good. And they can either develop them and recruit recruit and develop them, or they can, for lack of a better phrase, buy them. And, you know, one way or the other, you have to get players who are, you know, all-conference players, guys that are going to get drafted. Um, you know, I also wrote in the Rewind today, I, I don't think anyone from the rest is going to get drafted. The most likely player to get drafted may be a long snapper um, that they got, by the way, through the transfer portal. That That's not where Nebraska wants to be. They, they don't want to be a program where guys don't get drafted and you have, you know, you have your, your top prospects, you know, the top, your top, maybe one of your top playmakers on last year's team is trying to make the NFL as a special teamer. You know, he ran a four seven at pro day. That's mm-hmm. not what you want. Mm-hmm. Like it's just reality. You, you want guys that run four fours and four fives. And Omar Brown did that. He run a, ran a four five three, which is really good. And, and he may he may get a look as a result, but but Nebraska just has to get more dynamic uh, all over the field, and and that that's you know the the player that was that signed with Nebraska's recruiting class that is the most likely to get drafted in this year is Luke McCaffrey, who played receiver at right mm. the last two years. <laughs> Luke is probably going to be a mid round pick, and. I don't put this uh, now. Maybe Damon has a different perspective. I don't put this on Frost. I, I think Luke sent mixed messages when he was here about what he wanted to do and what he wanted to be, and and I, I you know, Frost didn't figure it out either. But I don't put it on Frost that he didn't put McCaffrey. He tried putting McCaffrey at receiver, and I think the kid. Want, I mean, 
I know McCaffrey went on something and said, you know, they never talked to me about, you know, switching the receiver. They played you at receiver. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. They didn't ask you. (laughs) They put you there. Well, that was interesting because if they, if they didn't, if they never asked him, then why did he leave? Well, I I mean, I think, do you know what I mean? yeah, I mean, I think there's he wanted he wanted to. Try it was just weird to put years. that out there like that, knowing it oh, it, it, it could it, it could poten- it could potentially have more leave more questions than answers. I mean, what do you want them to do? They put you at the position against Maryland mm. in 2019. They're basically telling you, <laughs> you know, and that's fine. He can do whatever he wants to do and and say whatever he wants to say. The reality is these are the kind of things that have stopped Nebraska up. They didn't have a running back in 2019 because Maurice Washington was a, was a, you know, a grease fire. So Wondell Robinson's playing running back instead of receiver. Mm-hmm. Luke McCaffrey's, you know, hell bent on playing quarterback, even though he's not very good at it. And he ends up at receiver. You know, these are two guys that they could have had a receiver uh, t- that, that would have been probably would have helped Scott keep his job and they couldn't keep either one of them in the program. So, so it's so it's like a, that. it's it's interesting, right? That's why I don't like to make sweeping judgments or or I try not to get in my glass house. Right. So we're talking about the whole running back thing and and, uh, you know, how much is the, the close being to the top? Not mean you're mediocre. And what if you could just. Imagine if Nebraska, and I, this just goes with my current thinking. I'm not, this isn't, I want to revisit the failures, but just imagine if Nebraska had somebody else that they could put in place other than Wandell Robinson to run inside zone for three or four games during that stretch. If you could just get a serviceable running back to get you four, four and a half yards where you didn't have to play Wandell Robinson so much at running back the the potential trickle down effect that could have happened whether he stays whether that steadies Nebraska's offense all sorts of things could have happened but when that opportunity presents itself again in 2024 we better be careful about not be being too dismissive if you don't have that clear cut guy sometimes your strength can be in the numbers you just have to wait and see what it looks like before you get in your feels Right. And I think you can, you know, somebody can separate at that particular position. Sometimes it doesn't happen right away. Divine, Divine did that midway through the 2018 season. Mm-hmm. He didn't do it right away. He didn't start right away. Um, the eel did. He, he, he forced them to play him. And sometimes it's right. just like that. Mm-hmm. So that's why yeah. it doesn't ruffle my fa- If Coach Rule says, hey, you know what? We want to get, or Thomas, or whomever the coach says, we want to get all three quarterbacks ready to play. Guess what? They're not smoke blowing to buy time. That's everybody's dream. You want yeah. to be able to have options. You don't want to be tied to one particular thing in a power conference like that. It's just, they're not blowing smoke. I agree. Yeah, I think they need depth at, at every position. I'm sure they'd love options at every position. It becomes harder in, in an era where you haven't made a bowl game in seven years. And so guys aren't sure what they're sticking around for from a win-loss perspective. And then I don't know. You know, I think one of the reasons Dan's talked a lot about 1890 is because there's now, I think there's a clarity of um, impression from a new AD who doesn't know any of the people running 1890 and doesn't care that they have to build up that operation very quickly to compete with teams like Ohio State and Oregon or otherwise, those teams are going to run away and hide. Sam, we and, got and they're going. To- we got beat by a team at home that had a second option at kicker, and we got beat. Right. So I will never be dismissive of depth anywhere on a football field, because you know what this this team that we can't stand right down the road had the stones to trot out walk on kicker for a game winner in the diciest right. of all situations. And they got a dub out of it. So, I, I, you know, I, I want to be very, very clear here. We don't be that group that is too good to, to, to think you need depth across the board. You always want options as a coach. And I think, I think they have that. Like, I think, I think they have options in a lot of places. And certainly, our operation has helped them 
to create, you know, depth on the offensive line. I don't think that if one guy gets hurt, they're sunk. Um, and so I think they have depth in, in certain spots. I'm sure they want more at the receiver spot. So they have depth at running back. I mean, at the end of the last year, Emma Johnson was getting it done. He wasn't bad after two guys had gotten hurt and, you know, other guys had gotten banged up. And, you know, Emma Johnson was still there playing football. They felt like they had enough depth last spring that they were comfortable with A.J. Allen leaving. Um, it's just, you know, you want to have somebody who really can stand out. I, I'm sure they hope that Dante Dowdell, they didn't bring him here to, you know, to carry it 34 times next year. They want him to be really good. And my understanding is that he has the potential to be that. It's a question of consistency, um, you know, being asked to be good when mm. last year you weren't really weren't asked to do that because Oregon had a couple guys ahead of you, like all those things. You know, those are those are the challenges that they have to – and the fact that the number one running back on the team is Gabe Irvin is not really ready. You know, like I don't if, – if Irvin were in practice, it might it might lift Dowdell's game or, or, you know, if Irvin were more healthy. So, you know, we don't know what Gabe Irvin is going to do. Um, he'll come back. He, you know, he had some moments last year. We'll see how he does this year. But, you know, yeah, depth's important. So is outstanding play, like finding guys who are, who are elite. Sam, uh, is it more important to have options at a position because you worry about, hey, maybe a guy's not playing well or a, a guy gets injured or whatever, kind of the way we saw it running back or at wide receiver last year? Or is it more important, like we've seen maybe with past coaching staffs, to have options so you're not tied to a guy who isn't about what you want to be about? I think probably both. I think, I think both both circumstances are important. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you yeah. want to have depth at, at every position and, and you, you want to try to, you know, develop competition within a group that again, elevates the, you know, rising tide. So if a player starts to separate himself, everybody else gets better too, because they see this guy's improving. And, you know, that's where you, that's where you hope you've recruited. That that's where you hope you've recruited guys that, that's their personality because what the last little thing you kind of just threw in there as a throwaway, it might be the most important because especially if you're in a program where they're going to try to continue to recruit over you, 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 you better be built where if somebody's setting the benchmark, your person is going to go get it right. As opposed to right. man, I can't believe they just did X, Y, and Z with this guy. I'm in trouble. Right. Right. Cause you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to be around those people. Right. And you sure. certainly don't want them around your program. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I like, think, I think that's very true. So you look, there's two players last year. There's a difference. Miles Farmer left the program. Omar Brown stayed. I think they probably are happy that Omar Brown stayed. Hey, you know, and Brown they would, you team. could make the case. That, that's a fantastic point. You could have made the case that at one point they're in the exact same position. It was all on how they handled it. Mm. Yep. That's Sam McEwen. I agree. From the Omaha World Herald, Sam, great stuff. We appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you next week. Good Take stuff, care. Sam. Bye. That's Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. We get that stuff out of Sam. Coach Kuhn from the Omaha Superdome is coming up next here on Herd Sports Radio.
we will be back. We will be back. We will be back. We will be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. We're halfway through the show here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We are joined now by Coach Kuhn of the Omaha Supernovas. Coach, how are you this morning? Hi there. Good. How are you guys doing? <laughs> good, good. I tell you, man, I'm kind of jealous. You, I say this every time we hang up with you. Your voice is built for radio. We, we may have to do this more often. <laughs> um, well, it's funny because I love radio. I've been going – I mean – at Kansas, we had a radio station, and m we had radio. Um, and actually, I'm good friends with a couple of guys here that do, uh, what is it, the big party. So I've gone down to the <laughs> radio. So secretly, it's kind of one of my dream jobs, guys. Oh, shoot. Well, there, there you go. Keep keep polishing those vocal cords. I'll say, well, we know and a rack guy. And racking W's. Do both of those We things. know a guy <laughs> who might be able to help you out there with the, with the radio situation. Uh, That's co- amazing. Coach, obviously, you've... Uh, you're getting down to the nitty gritty in terms of the regular season. But before we get into that, I don't think we've talked to you since the championship was announced for being in Omaha. Obviously, that's 
a thing that you guys want to be a part of, not just kind of hosting. But how exciting right. is it to know that the inaugural PVF championship is going to be right here at the CHI Health Center? I mean, the whole the concept is a shout out to the state of Nebraska and just everything this sport means to this area. I mean, we've all said it since we started the league, like this is the epicenter of volleyball. And there are a lot of regions throughout the country that are very saturated with volleyball and really good volleyball. But right now, Nebraska and the way that they show out, even our home crowds and the support that we feel as a first year team. I mean, it's so special and our, our players love it. But the community, I mean, shout out to them that we uh, kind of earned the right to host here. Uh, so we're excited. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of work to do and we we need to be in it, but um, we're excited for the sport and that we get to host it here in Omaha. Uh, you're putting yourself in good spot, just two games out, and, and this isn't an uh, Atlanta radio station, but six in a row. When you look at how you pull that off, because I like to pick your brain sometimes about you know, mm-hmm. repetitive teams and, and the nuances and whether it's execution versus strategy, how much you can do over and over. When, when you get to a number like six within this league, is 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 that more about the talent or just being able to set a standard of where you 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 got to beat the teams in this league that you're supposed to be better than and I know I cringe using that word in sports right mm-hmm. supposed to but like if you want to separate yourselves at the end to have a chance to play back here in, in Omaha you have to kind of start to do those things right about now don't you right yeah and that's the idea like you always want to separate yourself and that's why I also say in a, in a league this small, there's 17. So the separation is pretty tight. Um, we've kind of set ourselves up early on, but now, I mean, over the course of time, any team, like every team has talent. And so everyone's playing better. And like props to Atlanta. They are coming on right now and they're playing their best volleyball. Um, and it's really just their consistency. Um, they've, they've like kind of settled into their system. They're using the same setter that um, – they started using when they came here and played us the last time. Mm. And so they've kind of settled into their offensive system and they found this rhythm. And then it is, it's just execution and how consistent can they compete night, night to night when they play different teams. And so they've kind of figured that out, uh, figured that algorithm out with their team and their squad. And so now for them, it'll just be that consistency. And that's what we're all striving for. You know, um, it's keeping people healthy. It's keeping, I'm like everyone is locked in and I, yeah. the thing about the pro league is everyone wants to win everyone's competitive and so then it's like figuring out to win i said it in the locker room after that match we have to figure out how to win when it's ugly mm-hmm. like when shit doesn't seem right and didn't mean to cuss on the radio that's Come okay on. you can say anything once coach <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing uh but yeah i mean we have to figure it out like when we're in that we have to figure out how to win ugly and it plays and it's now we have our competitive chemistry, but now it's making plays and finding the way to win. So we'll, we'll figure that out. We have a good group. Is there a, you know, you, you look at the standings and I, and I get it. I don't think, listen, the top half of the league, even San Diego with, with a losing record is, is 500 or better at home. Mm-hmm. This at this stretch in the season, how important is it to be able to win on the road? Like it's usually, usually you want to defend your home turf. And we talked to you about that a couple of weeks ago, but the road mm-hmm. records are really starting to set themselves apart as well. Well, I know. And what's funny is we were winning on the road. Yep. We were the we <laughs> that, so out. when I asked you that, you had a better record on the road. Right. So, <laughs> but then we kind of flipped the script and we knew we had to focus on protecting our home and, you know, building that. And now <laughs> we need to balance that back out. Now yeah. we're hitting the road again. So we need to get back into our other mentality, which it is. It's just, I mean, I don't really think it's a, home or away mentality, I think it's a consistency of how you're training, how you're preparing, no matter where you're playing. And that's that's the difference with pro and this level. It is the ability to lock in and, and find out what it takes within as individuals and then as a team. I mean, because individuals can play really well, but if you're not playing well as a team, then it's not really going to work in the sport. So it's really finding that, that balance. Coach, last one for me before we get you out of here. You, your schedule has been – a little uneven in the sense of you played, I think, four games in eight days from the end of March to early April, and then you had nine days off between that match and your yeah. last one in Atlanta, and then you got another full week uh, before you, you return home here on Saturday. How do you kind of manage going from 
there's really just no consistency in the scheduling and like when you're playing your games, your preparation for a nine day layoff versus four games in eight days has to be wildly different, right? For sure. But I mean, we take advantage of that time for recovery too. Mm. Like we've given them time off because we have a, obviously a wide variety of, of youth and age and experience we'll call it on our team. And so I think any time off and that recovery time is really valuable, especially when you fit and then you're on a grind of like three matches in seven days or whatever it is coming up. Cause we have that again, mm -hmm. early, early May, we have the same thing. And so we kind of look at the big picture and what's best long-term physically because mentally that is the challenge. Mentally it's the execution of game plan. It's making the adjustments in match. I don't, I'm not as concerned because I think we've managed it with our, our uh, performance team. We've managed the load pretty well with this group. And so knock on wood, hopefully that isn't as much of our challenge as much as just locking in and executing. That is Coach Laura Kuhn, the Omaha Supernovas head coach. Coach, we appreciate your time. As always, good luck on Saturday. And uh, hopefully we see all of our friends out there at CHI Health Center. Yeah, thank you. Guys. You guys have a good one. We'll see you at CHI. Appreciate it, Coach. That is Coach Laura Kuhn of the Omaha Storm Supernova. Do you, do you feel Sorry, like, I got baseball on the brain. You, Omaha Supernovas. Do you are you reluctant to call her bird? Because sometimes I want to say that. So here's why. Yes, I am. <laughs> my she does have a cool voice. No, she does. But my so my wife's kitchen nickname is Bird. So like all of her people in her kitchen call her bird and so i have a hard time okay like, what, what can you give me the so apparently when she first started on the hotline it's like real loud in there and stuff and it's like kind of chaotic and when she would like yell for stuff people thought she was like it sounded like she was like calling like a bird and so they <laughs> started calling her bird and uh out of kitchen nicknames it's really not bad because those people get a little dicey sometimes oh yeah but yeah <laughs> but uh so yeah i have a hard time like, I think Bird, I think of my wife, and then it's like, so it's weird. It's just that, yeah. So I avoid it. I, I stick with I, Coach Kuhn. I've, you know, I've, I used to watch Bar Rescue. And, yeah. And, yeah. And I'm a huge, I mean, Cooking Channel comes up on my streaming. is one of my I like favorites. the Gordon Ramsay one better, which is that. He's over the top, but that's cool. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But I, but I watch like, uh, was it Kitchen Diners Nightmares? Drive, all of those yeah. shows, right? Yeah. So the, the line stuff back there and the chaos. It's so chaotic. Is, is incredible. I, and I, I I asked Verzal because he he first of all he made it on time. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the reason I got in trouble. What'd you get in trouble for? And I forgot this because it is cool, and I think they trust me. But you're not supposed to be on your phone. Mm, yeah, yeah. In in the stadium. Yeah. Uh, you know during yeah. So, and I had it in front of me. It wasn't in my hand. Mm -hmm. And and he texts. He's like, "Hey, I'm here. Do I need a pass to get in?" So I. I I voice text. I said, Hey, hold on. And then I put my phone and I'm not thinking you're not supposed to be on your phone. That's mm -hmm. just whatever. Yeah. And then he asked again, he asked me another question. So I was going to call him and one of the guys walked around. He's like, Hey, DB, come on, come on, help me out here. You know better. <laughs> and I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> so I didn't look at it again, but then he showed up like 20 minutes later, but the whole cook thing, he can only work around so many people because he didn't go to bed. Mm -hmm. He had to have 200 pies in Lincoln yeah. by 11. Yeah. So he could only be back there with a certain amount of people because it is controlled chaos. Oh, yeah. It gets a little hectic <laughs> down there. <laughs> Luckily, she's in the banquet department now, which is a little better. Not not quite as chaotic. I ain't but trying to work with that dude at 2 a.m. It still has its moments. Uh, that's DB. I'm Rob Lula. We'll wrap up hour number two. Coming up next. We will be back.
we will be back. We'll be back. How's that? We'll be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. Wrapping up our number two here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN, Omaha ESPN, Tri-Cities, live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. If you've missed anything, go back and get the podcast wherever you get your podcast. That's DB, I'm Ravi Lula. Go back and get the cuss words, Shane. I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody, nobody swears on the. She go did. back she and just, get the shift. Yeah, she said you got the get, shift. What did she say? You got to get your own shift together. Shoot, baby, shoot. She's a big football fan too, right? Yeah, shift formation. Right. Yep, you movement, need motion, pre-snap motion. Exactly. Got a lot of 49ers, I, I, I Kyle Shanahan yep. stuff going on there. Okay. Uh, one thing that I also don't want you to miss is the Team Jack Live event that's going to be right here at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill in La Vista. All proceeds from this event are going to Team Jack, and you're going to have an opportunity to see Kenny Bell, Nate Gary, and Amir Abdullah on stage together, and it will all be all to benefit Team Jack. You can go to the Hurt at Sports Bar, uh, Hurt at Sports Bar on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. There is a link to get tickets there. Um, you can go and get signed up for team jack live all proceeds go to the team jack foundation or you can always go to teamjackfoundation.org to just get involved directly with them there but i'm excited for that that's april 26th the day before the spring game oh. team jack live and i and it'll be a great event you can ask those guys tons of questions just make sure you come out and support good cause um it, it's just obviously our our favorite place um and you don't even have to call it the the pillar exteriors 
stage. Only, only when we're here. Only when we're only here. Only when we're here. We Although I do think it's on the door now. Oh, I know. Yeah, they, I was they, like, got, they got to work. That was quick. <laughs> but uh, uh, Nate was there uh, Saturday morning again. Yeah. So, yeah, because he's finishing up school. So it'll be good to pick his brain because he's somebody that I actually like to. And I sat by myself. I was probably the only one in South. Well, me and Micah, mm -hmm. the only one in. I guess that's South. Yeah, South Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there are some guys that I do like to talk to from time to time. And Nate Gary is definitely one of them. Knows his ball, too. Yeah, you like people that – you like talking to people that know what they're talking about. Yeah, like anything yeah. else is just like sidebar chatter. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I like – Nate sees some flashes to the way that they practice too, especially in like nine on seven and like the physical stuff mm -hmm. um, that I think he can, he's messing with. He's a good dude. He's got some grays. He's, and you know, listen, it happens to the best of us. Super long hair too. Like he's, that's, I mean, that's truly white snake. <laughs> he wasn't facing me and I, I, I stuck my hand in his pocket because I thought I saw uh, money. Yeah. And like he didn't slap my hand away or nothing. I said, "Hey, give me what's in there." He goes, "You ain't gonna find nothing. <laughs> Just watch where you're digging." And I was like, "That is such a Nate Gary thing to say." <laughs> I was like, "This dude is wild," but yeah, good dude. Let's get to our friend here, out of breath, Brian. He wants to talk a little running backs. We were chatting with Sam RBs about the good old RBs here great, earlier. That's, that's good. That's that's good stuff with Sam. It was it was good stuff for sure. Let's get to the herd at hotline with out of breath, Brian. What's going on, bud? What's going on, fellas? Well, hello, <laughs> baby. What's up? What's up? You're going to like what I have to ask about running back. But before I do, just an interesting question I have. Uh, uh, about a pronunciation of something, E L K H O R N. Is it L horn as in corn on the cob, or is it elk horn as in the elk horn? I just want to know. <laughs> we'll meditate on that and get back to me on that later. Uh, what the next question. Uh, this, 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 you know, just just interesting thing to hit my head today. Just okay. you know, okay. off the off, off the rack. Uh, running back. I just wonder. You know, I've been watching the NFL and. The, the the culture of running back and they're telling me uh you can find them a dime a dozen why we can't find six six we can't huh? we, can, we can't find like two but i don't we know about can. six what's wrong with you hey listen let, this isn't hate running back morning we now. haven't we, found two no no yet. no 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 i love running back i'm being sarcastic oh. they telling me running backs Oh, you can find them a dime a dozen. They devalue you. They devalue you uh, running backs. So now uh, uh, I'm glad to ask the question: Have they made uh, people not want to play running back? That now we have a, a lesser stock of good running backs to choose from because of the devalue on the running back. That's just my question. I mean, it, it, it works its way downhill. It works its way downhill. We can't find six, but you can get them a dime a dozen. Is what I heard. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, so something's got to give. Can right? I ask you a question, Brian? Sure. Is it possible that the running backs are fine in terms of when you bring them in, but the development and the offensive line and the play calling? I hasn't don't know been about there. that. Man, you you can say that all you want. I'm asking. NFL, I'm asking the the question. Question. Hey, I'm not, I'm answering your question with what I'm being told. That's I'm it. being told. I'm hey. I'm just hey. Look. I don't really know. I'm not a it's professional. It's even hard I'm, to. I'm asking the pro. It's even hard to appreciate <laughs> locally. Like we had a guy rush for yeah. sixteen hundred yards and he was an afterthought, mm -hmm. and he was totally the I'm key just, to what we yeah. did. <laughs> so it's like I, 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 <laughs> you you got it. You got every running back. Great running backs don't grow on trees, and but I'm being told that you can find them anywhere. They're just laying out there on the street, can there Okay, is, there's a so, de there's a definite disconnect. I agree with that. And, I, I get what you're, I get. What you're I saying get what he's sure. saying, but I also think there is a situational dependence at the position too right like a running back yeah. in you know let's go back to denver in the late 90s it really felt like they could throw anybody out there and it was going to be fine right now they probably had a really good idea now this is where identity comes in right so you have a really good idea of what a running back needs to be able to do to be successful in your system right you could use kyle shanahan as an example of this before they got mccaffrey they had a kind of a hodgepodge of guys and it worked out pretty well 
because he knew exactly what those guys needed to do in order to be successful in his system. That's where you get to the point of uh, they're kind of a dime a dozen because there's a lot of guys with certain skill sets that if you know what you need, you can plug and play. The problem is, especially at Nebraska, if you don't really have a very specific identity you're searching for at that running back spot, it becomes really hard to be successful, even if you are a talented guy. So it's not like we're going to be cleaning cleaning house and get rid of some running backs when we, we get the ones that identify with the system. I, I, would, I would expect that, going off of your statement. I mean, maybe. So, I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe I, there's guys would, in the room already that they like. I don't know. Hey, and then the other thing, I do like the little you know conversation you had a couple of segments ago, uh, children need diversity. I, I like it because I always – Say something to my kids. Hey, y'all need to be happy about parents that you have, if you have them, because you're getting uh, controlled, simulated uh, uh, assistance at, at life. So you can tie a tie when you face adversity, you have somebody there to assist you. And you get someone to try to help you uh, manage your feelings and emotions to get through those things to try to make it through the other side. So uh, you guys talk about that a little bit more. I like that subject. I and you guys have a great evening. Thanks, B. Appreciate you, Brian. All right, listen, I, I'm, um, it's – revisionist history so it can kind of sound cool to say and and i was just telling this there are a couple of parents that have local kids being recruited Mm -hmm. and you get to see some parents out and stuff and even players we're playing against that i that i actually that i like really like um in, in particular like guys like ike ackerman right who was at practice from central the other day and i know it's weird that when you see some people that you coach against you like oh man you know I, I like that guy like I'm gonna cheer for you right mm-hmm. I can I can say good things about whomever right yeah Marion Jackson or Tyson Terry or or whatever right just guys we play against that aren't our guys but why I say that is because what I kind of gravitate towards is what Brian's talking about when you get these when you get kid young men and, and sometimes women if it's it's if it's a female sport where you get that those kids can function and not everything has to go right. Mm-hmm it's usually a byproduct of, of what's going on at home, mm-hmm. right? The, I'm going to see this through. Uh, I'm not going to take my good ball. or to the bad. Right. Honestly. I don't know. I understand. Right? right. Cause, cause real time, you don't get to pick the outcome. Yeah. Otherwise you do it differently. So you're right. Yeah. It, Cause it, it, I know people that have been through really tough upbringings that they're way better for it yeah. in terms of as an adult, they're able to function at really high levels. They're able to do all these things. Right. But I also know people who have been through it and they've never recovered. Yeah. And that's the difference that near miss versus remote miss we were talking about. And I could speak to that firsthand because remember, there was this stretch from like last May mm-hmm. to September mm-hmm. of last year where I was like, oh, should I go back and get some things? Because if I have to, it's too late. Sure. Because I was dealing with the remote versus near when I wanted a desired outcome. Mm-hmm. I, I hey, listen, this is what I want. This is what I think should happen with my kid, but I may have to let him go through it and potentially fall on his face. Yeah, make the wrong choice. And w- or what you th- perceive as uh, maybe wrong is the wrong. No, I you know I got to entertain that because selfishly, what you felt was the wrong choice. Yeah. May yeah. not have been the wrong choice, but yeah. how you felt selfishly, was the wrong it would have been the wrong choice for me. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> but there's a been, difference there. But I could also see, like, if there were some other things, I was like, oh, okay, I could see why he picked that. I could see why. He picked but there's that. certain times where you need to let them make the wrong choice. Yeah, because and, that's the that's the and controlled it was, adversity. And there was a stretch before that year, especially when he was hurt, where it's like I should have done more. Like I, I let him go through this, mm-hmm. and yeah, maybe he'll be better for it. I don't know. Like I'm rolling the dice. That's the hard part. And I don't, obviously I'm not a parent, so I don't have this, but that's the hard part about being a parent or a coach or somebody who cares about the young person yeah. because you want to protect them yep. because you don't know the result. Yep. But uh, it's you're so often doing them a disservice. It's the coddling versus caring, right? It's very, it's a fine line. And if you coddle versus care, you're setting them back. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult real time. It's it, That's it's why when I see it, incredibly hard I, real I, time. I, I, gra- I gravitate towards it. Really good conversation. We're going to continue talking about Nebraska here with Stephen M. Sipple coming up next on Hard Ass Sports Radio.
we will be back. will be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. How's that picture look? I mean, you guys have not had any trouble in that area at all, right? Why? Why you got to say that? <laughs> You're like my son. He's like, you know, it's like a jinx. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's... Kicking off hour number three here on Hurt at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. KFOR in Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And we're here now at the Pillar Exterior stage talking to our guy, Steven Marcellus Sippel from Husker Online. Sip, what's going on, bud? 
I like Mark Scholar. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to come up with a new one for you that I hadn't gotten hadn't done yet. Good. That was pretty good. <laughs> Steve, no no peer pressure to answer out loud because I know you're going to say what you want to anyway. But you have to be missing me, right? Like, do I, yeah, I do. do you? Okay, that's good because <laughs> I feel like Actually. I always see you in the spring and I haven't yet. Yeah, where's yeah? What's the deal? Yeah, it, it was nice when Shane. It's very comforting when I get text from Shane. It feels like the old days. <laughs> Comforting. <laughs> well, you're just as weird as ever, so that's that's good, man. Uh, how, how you how you been, man? Do you we're you're full fledged into this thing? Couple years almost. No, nah, are you on a two year anniversary yet? But how do you like the recruiting world or that portion of your new of your of your later life new world? Two year anniversary. Yeah, we are. I think it's May. Yeah, when it's start. coming up. Yeah, good job. Um, thank you. It's not too much different because it, I did do a, you know, I worked with, with, you know, beat writers, mm -hmm. uh, the Journal Star who, who, you know, were heavily involved in recruiting, namely like Brian Christopherson, you know, for a period and then Parker Gabriel. So I was not, I, I, I was in it. I stayed in it. I had to stay in it. Not, not to the extent that I am now, but I'm not. I mean, Brian Munson doesn't turn to me for recruiting information. <laughs> hey, hey, Steve, what do you think? What are you, what are you hearing? <laughs> Very rarely. I mean, there's some cases where I can help, um, few and far between. But those guys, I mean, those those guys like Brian and Sean, and even Robin on the basketball side, they don't. They're so dialed in that it's it's sort of remarkable to me. Munson's a veteran. Um, so he, you know, they handle that. So it's not that much different from that. The, the answer is it's not all that much different from that standpoint. So Sip, I mean, since we're talking a little recruiting here, Nebraska did land a couple of, I presume, wide receivers. I know Jackson Carpenter's listed as an athlete some places over the weekend. You, you think we're kind of in that stretch where we might start to see a little bit of that summer push we've seen in in recent, or well, I guess just last year from coach rule where he put in put in the work on a majority of his class kind of in post spring early summer well yeah i mean i knew i knew i do know enough to say that the way it works now is we're not we're probably not in that part of that period yet but yeah i mean when you get into june um yeah i think it'll start popping because that's when a lot of the commitments happen a lot of the actions happening in the summertime we're probably a little early for that. Um, as far as these two latest commits, uh, I'd say that, you know, Brian Munson saw Carpenter coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, known about Bryson Hayes, the kid from Mays, Kansas, right outside of Wichita. Those guys, those guys, Sean and Brian Munson, had known about him. Uh, I think the commitment might have caught him by surprise a little bit. Um, the, I, the timing. I, it did me just because um, Kansas State is so good at what they do mm -hmm. in terms of how they recruit and their specific their attention is very specific. They don't they don't recruit a lot of loosey goosey guys like they kind of zero in and they got a good process. And I am a little surprised that it was this early because I thought K State could make it pretty interesting. Yeah, and KU was a factor. I know they're good. Hey, they're in the same boat. They mm -hmm. they do a good job too, Sip. Yeah, KU definitely wanted him. I know that. For I mean, KU wants to establish itself in Kansas more. I think KU still has a little trouble getting the you know the hot. I mean, I know Lance, so I'm not speaking totally out of turn here. I think they want to they want to establish themselves more with the high-end Kansas kids than Bryson Hayes would be that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, those two Kansas schools won it in battling. Nebraska went in and plucked Bryson Hayes, who's a receiver, um, from from KU and Kansas State. They both legitimately recruited him hard. Mm. Sip, speaking of getting in on the high-end in-state guys, Bryson Hayes is mm. actually the first commitment outside of the state of Nebraska for – Nebraska mm -hmm. for 2025. I mean, mm -hmm. how dramatic has been? You've seen the efforts of Coach Rule and staff. Obviously, with last year's class, 
but again this year where five out of their six or four out of their five commits so far are in the state guys. Yeah, it's kind of inverse, like the way that usually happens a lot of times. So it started off this way. Um, and it's, I think it's telling. I mean, it's all these decisions. I mean, I try to, I try not to, as Damon knows, I try really hard not to paint with a broad brush because especially with these, these, this topic, because these are individual decisions. Um, but, you know, like a Caden Vermont, hell, Caden Vermont has been committed for a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he literally has been committed, I think, he almost exactly a year now. Yeah, we're about a week off, but yeah. 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 So, and then, you know, there's other guys in that, in that group that have been committed for some time. Tyson Terry's been committed, I think, since, for, since last summer. Um, Booth has been committed so, since August. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, they are individual decisions, though, but I like it. I mean, I, obviously, I like it. I think I know this. I know, well, I know because I just got off the phone with, with Tim Carpenter. Um, Lockjaw, good dude, great dude. Yeah. <laughs> they, in, I think what you're finding is these Nebraska kids feel very comfortable that this staff is here for the long haul. And that there's just a, there's just a, there's just like overall comfort. Um, I know that Tim felt that, and he wanted that as a dad. He wanted to feel like, you know, this my son's going to be at Nebraska for a period of time, you know, for four or five years, and that this is this is the staff that's going to be with him. Uh, and some people probably listen and go, why why was that even a question? Well, I don't know. It's always a question, right? Um, in, in college football to a, to a certain degree. And it's, it's just a question the other way too. I'm sure coaches, if they're if like a Nebraska coaching staff members are listening, they, they think of it the other way. Well, Jackson Carpenter will be with us for five years. <laughs> because a lot of times that way. Um, but man, it does. I think with these Nebraska kids, I mean, I, I'll try to get somewhere with this conversation. With Nebraska kids, they're probably a little more likely to stick, right? And these kids, if you just look at them individually, they seem very likely to stick in the program, which is what Rule uh, Rule wants that, right? He wants to develop players, and that's what these kids be. Now, I, I, I'm going to say this knowing full well that some people aren't going to be able to handle the context because you're going to you're going to you're going to hear a '90s reference, but I, I'm unapologetic when the shoe fits. Whether okay. whether it's whether it's me being recruited at a very competitive position during a competitive time, because remember Nebraska wasn't quote unquote good yet <clears throat> when they made this run on a lot of in-state guys in the early '90s. They were getting there. They weren't over the top yet, right? People still, relative to their success, were a little reluctant to embrace Coach Osborne as a guy that could win the big one. Mm-hmm. You, you remember those days, right, Sip? Absolutely. Do, yeah. So as a parent and as a guy that was recruited during that time, there is a couple of similarities. Number mm-hmm. one, a lot of local guys are saying yes, even though they're not where some other competitive recruiting teams are, because you're getting the sense you want to be a part of something that's brewing, right? Like it, it, right. it feels like, something good is going to happen. I want to get in on this. So there's that part. Then there's the other part from a parent. And I think Timmy feels like this. And I know a couple of other guys do that have legacy guys, whether it's, whether it's Toby, Wright, Whether it's, there's a ton Booker. um, Mm -hmm. This whole cycle has a thousand. (laughs) You want, you're willing to sacrifice a little. Maybe your kid being a star right away or at all or whatever to be around people that, you know, you get the sense they'll be good for them for the long haul. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It's like if, if, if ask Carp, ask Carp, ask Dylan, like, or Dom, and you guys have a good relationship. If you're not going to have your son. And he may struggle at times, which all kids do in college. You, there are certain people you want them around. And you just get the sense that this is a staff you want young men around because you may get them back. You're, there's, 
it seems like you'll get them back better than when you left them. Yeah, that seems like it definitely. And my familiarity is mainly with Coach Rule. And I would definitely say that. And I think you, Damon Benning, would, and I know Tim Carpenter would say, and I, Tim did say, that he's better off being around Coach Osborne, better off to being around that staff. Mm-hmm. It's a, he'll care, he carried that into adulthood. Um, so yeah, he's exa- exactly right. And I think you're, I think you're really, I do get the sense that people feel like, I mean, I, you always say like, oh, the program's headed in the right direction. It's kind of a cliche, but it does feel like there's a lot of good energy. No, they're really bad. Do, do, do really you know? Do, so here's the dirty little thing people don't want to talk about. A lot of times, guys in state either don't like or uh, don't like is kind of a strong word. Sometimes you don't want to go where other guys are going just because they're going there. Like that's a real thing in recruiting, especially yeah. in state. But you you kind of feel compelled. Like I don't want to miss out. Oh sure, I can get along with player X, Y, and Z now, even though we competed against each other for four years, because for the greater good, I don't want to miss out on something good. Like I I kind of feel like it was a lot like that early, right? For as much as I love Clinton, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, do we want to go to the same school? (laughs) Like we've been, but you know what I mean? It's just like, did did Dish want to do what Ogar did? Like, it's just, I, it seems like it's the place to be now, and you're willing to put that aside. Yeah, there's a bigger, yeah, like you said, there's a greater good and a bigger picture that that takes precedence over your little, you know, your little hangups with people, and that's the way it probably should be. Well, you don't get along at the quarterback spot if you're like, for instance, the practical application would be Kalen and Dylan. Yeah, right. You don't. You guys don't. You don't. You don't get along as a group or as a competitive group if if the culture can't sustain that or doesn't lend itself to that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. And I do. do, I think there is, I I don't mind. Like I I understand when you say culture is a turnoff word to some people. I don't, if you're, if you're immature. Yeah. It's not a turnoff word to me. Um, And I do. And I think what, that's what we're talking about. The rule has done a very good job in my opinion of quickly establishing culture. It's been pretty quick. Right. I mean, we're only in the second, but it's, it's quick. And I, I think it has to be nowadays um, because everything moves quick in college athletics or at least in college football. You know, it's very, you know, it's very, a lot of trans, there's a lot of transitions, players um, moving it, moving around. So when you bring in what I'm getting at here is when you bring in like a Jamal Banks for one year, if there's your culture kind of has to hit him fast. Yep. And he's got to get the culture fast. Yep. And they are the same with, with Stefan Thompson. It's, or how about this one? How about this one, Sip? How about Mazuka? You you, Mazuka you, 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 you bet you better get in line with the culture. <laughs> right. It, it's kind of funny because you can't at the same time. I don't, and I'm, and I've never run a program, but my, I've been around this program for 30 years. I think you also have to, there has to still be a little leeway. Like not everybody's going to adopt at the same time, Mm -hmm. adapt at the same time. They're not. People are different. People, it takes some people longer than others to adapt. There's got to be a leeway. But you know what? That runway has got to be inherently shorter now, just the way things go. But I, but I do, I mean it when I say, I think rule has, has, that's the rule way set in very quickly you know you you have a good you have a good feel you guys have a good feel for i have a good feel for it so so naturally the players have a very good feel for it we're talking with steven mortimer sipple here on heard out sports radio uh sip Mm. this is (laughs) marcella's greater than mortimer just saying well i'm just you know i've 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 gone through a lot of them now i'm i'm trying to trying to get creative next to be dropping mercutio or something uh i think i did that last week I think I did do Mercutio, Mercutio last week. I like uh, Marcellus. Yeah, I like. I, I kind of like Marcellus. Too, yeah, I so. think Marcellus you, and Montgomery have been your favorites so far. Yeah, I'm gonna keep looking though. That's what I do. I, I'm a worker. Sip. I'm just gonna keep looking. Um, <laughs> we 
we talked to uh, Sam McEwen earlier, and I asked him this question. And you, I'm, you I'm, know, Sam, Sam of the of the whole world here. I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you'll interpret it, so I'm going to leave it a little open ended. What position do you think is the most competitive this spring? Oh. Uh, um, <laughs> there's there's some in there. Uh, I would like. <laughs> no, I would like. <laughs> I want. I'm not gonna. I, you know, I always Damon knows. I always go to run it back. I'm not gonna because there's two guys that can't. You just can't. You know, yeah. they can't really be in it. Gabe Berg and Ramir. Yeah. Uh, oh, he's still Ramir uh, in 2024. When do you think he'll go back to rum here? I don't know. It's R A H. All right. All right. So Rob Mir and Gabe, they're out. So you're gonna go a different position group. I, I would like to go to corner. I mean the, the corner opposite Tommy Hill. I guess I guess what we're doing collectively is writing in Tommy Hill starter. Um but what's the what's the what's the other corner? It's gotta be hot. I mean that's gotta be hot. That competition has to be hot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to write Tommy Hill in if you don't want to. I'm, I'll, I'll entertain. I know one thing. It's demanding. Yeah, it should be. Um, it should be because it's critical. I, I think the corner spots will be fine, but I, I'd like to know who, who they are for sure. You know, um, and then, and then it's gonna be hot. I mean, across that secondary, it's hard to say exactly what the competitions look like because you don't know exactly the configuration mm -hmm. um mm. but man i know this i mean if you just look at like if you just look at safety i mean look at you got hard Sog, you got gifford you got singleton i mean not everybody can play so it's it's well those well, three got, will but yeah you're but right you i mean you what's got Mar you got marquis buford yep i mean good call who, who yeah, who's all who's all playing? Yeah, it's that. that this, I'd probably just say secondary overall because there's so many bodies, and I, you know, I'm not even naming them all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's guys. There's so many. It's, it's one of those things. There's so many that you off the hook. You kind of forget a few a few of them that are pretty good. So like Kobe Bretts, where's Kobe Bretts in that comment? I don't know. I mean, I just know they got a lot of talent back there. Um. And you know what? It'll get pretty hot at receiver to get in terms of. That's where I thought you'd go. Ball, yeah, where's the ball going? I mean, because they they have they have a lot of them now. Not a, like I don't want to portray this like it's Ohio State. Nebraska's not that. It's just now it's representative of what a Big Ten team should probably look like. Um, and you know, we'll we'll, we'll just, the competition is for where who's getting the most catches there. Yeah, I could see it easily being a couple of surprise guys will hit the portal and we'll have all these opinions and it could be nothing more than man, it's just deep. <laughs> it's just uh, it's deep. Yeah. It's just, I mean, just it's just deep. No, there's yeah. no there's no nothing crazy going on. It's just wow, I can't <laughs> believe that it's like, yeah, you know, portal's open now. Let me get let me let me get at least the last one for me, so because I'm beginning to think this is pretty underappreciated and it's not everybody's fault because they can't always be around it. But one thing that I love is when co when they talk about practice, it, it's like not just a word, right? There's a there's something to it, right? Showing up, being able to endure, you know. Coach yeah. Rule like kind of quietly likes to function in chaos and to see if other people could can. How much mm -hmm. how much do you think Nebraska's culture being set so quickly has to do with the fact that he doesn't mind a little hard work, he doesn't mind a little elbow grease. There's something to him that I think he thinks is cool about making people uncomfortable, right? Like yeah. even, he's even hard. He, you'd agree. He's hard on his staff too, right? Like there's oh, 100. a 100. It's amazing. It, 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 I'm floored at what he asks and how he delivers and disseminates information to his staff. How much of that at the end of the day, you think folks can appreciate? Cause at least the standard is set. Yeah, I think people appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, here's what I'd say. I always tell people about Rule. He's a he's a he's a hell of a leader. He's a he's a good boss, but I'm not sure I'd want to work for him. It's it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I, the man, it's like very good man. You know, I don't know. And it, it, it's an, it's intense. You know, usually I can 
you know, you go and you like to either smell the grass or a little bit of sweat on the pads or like it has a smell to it. You can feel the intensity. And I'm not saying it, it lends itself to like wins and losses. What I'm saying is, you know, when you're in a competitive environment, you can it, it's in the air. And I think it even starts with the staff. Oh, I do too. And I, and I do think the win, I do think it, I mean, his track record would suggest that it leads to wins and losses at the college level. I, I understand the Carolina deal, but yeah, it, 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 no, it's not for everybody, but if, but if, but if it is for you, it's a great environment. Yeah. And I, and I don't think it's not for me, by the way, I like the environment. I like the way it feels over there. I think that's what we're, that's this kind of this whole conversation is low level. It's kind of, kind of about that. I think we, we agree that the environment over there is, there's a lot of prompt with the way it is. And I like, and I do like, you know, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about free practice field going. We're talking about kids telling you, yeah, everybody has a shot now. Show what they can do. Um, kids say that. You know the player, the players, not all the kids, by the way. The players say that. Um, the old coaches say that they like it. And we're not just talking off the cuff. I mean, I, I talked to George Darlington on Saturday. They like, they like the way it feels. It's a lot of people that like the way it feels, but it is intense. I mean, yeah. that's the word always use for, I, and that's one of the words I would use for rules culture. I mean, when like Ricky Henry and Mike Caputo say, this is what I'm talking about. It feels competitive. <laughs> I mean, those are two pretty mean spirited, competitive people. They tackle now. I mean, they tackle, they tackle <laughs> a non tackling day. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. It is uh, I mean, I was, Ricky, I was watching Ricky. I was watching Ricky Henry last week and he's just nodding his head behind his sunglasses in approval. And that definitely was not a fake tough guy. You know what I mean? Oh God, no, 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 it, it is football now. It's football. The rules a bit of a throwback. And I think, are, and I think that's why he likes it here because I think people like that. Here. Are you surprised that it is as physical as it is? He's willing to let a few bodies. It seemingly, it's not intentional, right? But seemingly go by the wayside. Yep. He has to be willing for that to happen. Oh, I'm a little, I always am a little surprised, but I go back to the, Hey, it's football play football kids like it i think the kids like it that's the bottom line yeah that is steven marcuccio sipple husker online you strike me as more of a malik sip how about steven malik you gotta you want to go with malik i like malik montgomery or Marcel. if you one of those all, all right, right. All we'll, right we'll keep finding it sip we'll keep going hey we appreciate it Thanks, as sip. always bud all right god bless you more heard at sports radio coming up next Marcia still gets it back. Left wall for Eichel. Half a minute on the power play. Eichel scores! Top of the left circle. Jack Eichel in overtime. The Golden Knights win it after trailing by three. They defeat it after trailing.
LeBron. Austin Reeves got it back to LeBron, slam dunk. Great pass by Austin Reeves, 85-57. The Lakers lead by 28. Spencer the rebound, Warriors will dribble out the regular season, and it's going to be on to Sacramento. Final score will be 123-116, to and the Warriors come up with a 46-win season regular season and it's going to be on to sacramento final score will be 123 to 160 57 the lakers lead We'll be back. Welcome to Hurt at Sports Radio. Half a minute on the power play. Eichel scores! Top of the left circle. Jack Eichel in overtime. Austin Reeves got it back to LeBron. Slam dunk. Great pass by Austin Reeves. 85-57. The Lakers lead by 28. Spencer the rebound. Warriors will dribble out the regular season. And it's going to be on to Sacramento. Final score will be 123 to 116, and the Warriors come up with a 46 win season. We're back here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities, KFOR in Lincoln. You can find us live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We're here on the Pillar Exterior stage. But where we're where we were on Friday, DB and I got a chance to go out to Lawrence and Gardens for their Brickasaur. Brick Live Exhibit. It's over 30 iconic dinosaur sculptures made out of more than 1.5 million bricks. And seeing them, I would have thought it was at least 10 times that number. I would have thought it was 1.5 yeah, million I bricks. Would be, I would be curious to see if people could guess. Per, yeah. Don't look at this. Don't look at the signs because it tells you. Guess how because I would have guessed some of those were 1.5 million bricks per dinosaur. It was phenomenal. The texture, the detail out of those things was unreal do you want to make fun of me for having to touch like a child no i no i was curious too i just wasn't gonna do I it i was the only one that did it and it, no i did after you did but you kind of <laughs> gave oh, yeah let, yeah let the scapegoat go first yeah 100 percent. once like you did it i got permission to do it i would have been the guy that actually like touched it and the whole it, thing like, would have fell, fell over. over luckily it didn't because that's 1.5 million bricks is a lot to pick up i wasn't going to do that uh but you got through May 12th to get out to Lords and Gardens. It is fun for the whole family. Some might even call it dynamite to go visit there with and, your family. And, and shout out to Mia Copa. Yeah, Mia hooked us up with a little tour. It was great. Although it's really 
Maya. Yeah. Well, I said Maya Copa, and you're like, no, it's Mia Copa. And I was like, well, I was just trying to use her first name. <laughs> and at least she got, now, shout out to her, too, because she got my sense of humor. She did. And, of course, our guys from her that were like, oh, my God, we can't take you anywhere. Uh, but, <laughs> like, I'm funny. It's okay. <laughs> I don't get out much. It's, you go to lawrenceandgardens.org <laughs> to get your tickets. You can be amazed, but don't touch the sculptures like DB did. That's or, a no or get the itch to want to go get in the pond with the koi. <laughs> yeah, you were fascinated by those koi. Oh, they were huge. <laughs> but make sure you go check it out. It's super cool. Uh, that's Brickosaurs at Brick Live at Lords and Gardens. I didn't uh, know you could eat there either. Yeah, they got like a little little food area. Okay. They got like a little. I looked at the dirty plates that were stacking up with the. Uh, yeah, and I was like, huh, I wonder what that was. So then I was, of course, entertained by. Well, sure. Trying to guess what. Trying to figure out for... what people were eating. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you know, kind of the cool thing. This is what we learned when we went there. Was the plants that they have around the exhibit were either same species or like descendants of the species that were around with the dinosaurs. That was. That was crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. That's how you kind of get it in with the, the whole plant, the plant, the the plant life that survived with the dinosaurs couldn't. Yeah, little little punk dinosaurs couldn't couldn't hack it, but the plants could. Man, I I, I made it. You made it. Yeah, I, I officially have. I can function around other adults in public and spaces I'm not accustomed to being. <laughs> Do you think they got some? footage the b-roll of the two older or more mature ladies that were like <laughs> that's damon benning <laughs> i couldn't believe that we're walking in right yeah. trying to get a little intro doug so we did a video i'm sure it'll be out on socials soon here because our guys uh kyle and colin were killing it but how about kyle he's like yeah you're like this all the time aren't you it's not just the show <laughs> i'm like not all the time but like but when, when i'm it. comfortable yeah. a lot of yeah. it uh, no, it was, so we're walking in, we're trying to film this thing, and a couple of ladies go, that's Damon Benny. <laughs> and I had to wait because the camera was yeah. rolling. And then you, like, so, went back and said hi. And I yelled. I was like, hey, ladies, thanks for saying hi. And, like, everybody in between us and them, like, waved back. I yeah. was like, no, not you two. Or, no, 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 these no, over no, here, no, actually. Those, 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 those not two talking ladies, way, way over there. I'm not talking to you. Um, <laughs> Kyle was like, oh, good. <laughs> What are we about to deal with here? A child. <laughs> a child. Uh, it is a great place to bring your kids, though. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And why weren't they in school? Like, what was going on, do you think? I think there were some field trips there. Had to. Be. Like, I saw some school buses out in the other parking lot. Hey, how about my little dude getting it in with those big old duplex blocks? <laughs> like, what was he doing? He outside? was, man, he was, at, he he was, was locked. <laughs> He's like, I can make one of these dinosaurs. Let's go. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, nah, it was a lot of fun, though. And uh, you should definitely get out there to Lawrence of Gardens. Check that out. Between now and May twelfth, um, I wanted to get back to something that Sip said though, because Sip said a lot, lot, lot in there. He did, because he said he was talking about it not being for everyone, mm -hmm. and when you can come to a place, I mean, as an individual or as a program or whatever, but when you can get to a place where you can say, "Hey, this is this isn't going to be for everybody, and that's okay," it gives you a ton of freedom to operate because now some people use it as an excuse to be an a-hole and you know, you got to watch out for those people, <laughs> but what it does, at least what it did for me, cause it, you know, I, I kind of went through this journey personally was, and I think it's honestly one of the struggles that Nebraska has gone through is wanting to be for everyone. Not every four star that's interested is going to be for you. Not a good fit. Right. We saw that in early frost days for sure. We've seen it with we saw it in Riley, which with all the Calabrasca kids that were here like six months and then peaced out. We saw it, we've seen it with the Florida kids that there was this huge track record. Of, oh, nobody from Florida wants to stay here. I was like, maybe you're not right recruiting the right kid from Florida, right? You have to understand and you have to be okay with the fact, whether you're an individual, whether you're a football program, whether you're in your profession, whatever of saying, hey, I mean, we get it a, a lot, right? Because we get very public feedback on our jobs, right? Whether it's Twitter. I mean, you can leave reviews on <laughs> on yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. Like on podcasts. That's yeah, not for everybody. Like, if I, if I hadn't, like, gone to therapy and gotten to a place where I'm like, hey, I'm not going to be for everybody, but the people that like me are really going to like me. And the people that don't, they probably weren't ever going to like me anyway. When you can get to that place as a person or a football program, 
it gives you so much freedom to A, B, you, and B, succeed and sustain long term. So, and I think for anybody that this is what they're looking for, and I'm not, I'm not here to do a recruiting pitch, but I will say what works, mm-hmm. what I think a lot it has worked for a lot of people is number one, I think you're going to, you're going to be around some people that obviously have your best interest at heart. Mm-hmm. But number two, if, if you're a parent that has, that wants your kids to be in a situation where you get to eat what you kill, mm-hmm. that's the environment. This is the environment for you because for all, you know, and I heard this all along, right? Oh, you're taking too long. Or they have this person and that person. I'm like, oh, you know, I think we know what we're doing, but I appreciate that, whatever, mm-hmm. right? And some of it was stressful real time. So don't let me sit here and kid you that it wasn't. At the end of the day, what I felt like I could rest in was if, the, and I've said this out loud, people think I'm crazy because mm-hmm. it may actually include your own kid. But if you're creating an environment where it's survival of the fittest mm-hmm. and it's about showing up, and not just going through quote unquote practice and you're going to thin the herd. That's what I want mm-hmm. because that's what we can. I think that's what he can thrive in. I think that's what he wants. Selfishly as a dad, I think that's ultimately how life is. Mm-hmm. That's, <laughs> like, that, that's that adversity, right? <laughs> right. Like that adversity we're talking about. I, I like that's probably like not everybody's going to make it Mm-mm. and it's going to be too hard for some people. Not everybody's built that way. And that's okay. Yeah. Hey, it, th- it's not for e- everyone. Easier to get to the top. Not for everyone. And it's the difference between simple and easy because I think it's easy because that's the conditions in which we only know really one way in our household. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it's not always fun or looks functional from the outside because it's, it is a little messy. It is competitive Mm -hmm. and feelings get hurt too. Sure. Right. So, but that's the one that's the thing that I think I like. And I love it even more because I've seen it now in some practical applications at practice. Mm-hmm. It's not just player to coach. It's coach to coach too. Mm-hmm. It's coach to support staff. It's it's not for everybody, man. And there's such a standard. Yeah. It's it's like daily going through a colander. Mm-hmm. And, strain it out. And strain it out. You know, and 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 and, and got to hear my heart real quick because mm-hmm. it's the same thing that I gravitate towards that I like because it it helped me get through some pretty dark times because mm-hmm. I am competitive at the end of the day. It's nothing that I would openly pick to go back to because yeah. I don't want to have to be on all the time. But you know, you needed it. But I needed it. Yeah, I one hundred percent needed it. I'm glad you brought up simple versus easy because here's what I think people mistake. They want something simple, something they understand, something they know. Hey, if I do X, I get Y. They mistake that for what's easy because the simple things could be really, really hard. (laughs) But what we crave isn't easy. What we crave is structure. We crave knowing what is asked of us. And people confuse the simple, which is important but can be difficult, for the easy, which isn't going to make you any better. Mm. Coming up next, we're going to talk to John Rathaus. He's a former caddy and host of Quiet Please to wrap up the Masters. We will be back.
we will be back. We'll be back. Welcome to Hurt at Sports Radio. Scotty Scheffler, putter back and in. Scotty, Scotty, he's done it again. Scotty Scheffler, for the second time in three years, is the Masters champion. It's hard to put into words how special this is. I, uh, it's been a long week, a grind of a week. The golf course was so challenging, and to be sitting here wearing this jacket again and getting to take it home is, uh, is extremely special. Wrapping up the show here on a Monday on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR in Lincoln. That's TV. I'm Ravi Lula on the Pillar Exterior Stage, and we're brought to you by War Horse Sportsbook. Make sure you get to the casino in Lincoln or to Horseman's Park in Omaha. It's the best place in Nebraska to place your bets. Maybe a little bit made a little bit of money on our guy Scotty Scheffler on the Masters. Maybe a little bit made a little bit of money on UFC 300. You can bet on pretty much every major sporting event at War Horse Sportsbook. So make sure you get to the casino in Lincoln or to Horseman's Park in Omaha. If you've got questions, go to warhorsecasino.com slash sportsbook for a full list of details and house rules. That's War Horse Sportsbook. No bets, no glory. Joining us now on the Herd at Hotline is John Rathaus. He is a former caddy and he's the host of the Quiet Please podcast right here on Herd at Sports. John, how are you this morning? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Robbie and Damon. Jr. How how are things, man? Were you one of those guys that that took uh, or, or is laundering money through Vegas, man? I everybody's talking about value, three to one, man. Scheffler easier pick since the days of Tiger than riding Chef in this one. Unbelievable. Yeah, I saw some people <laughs> posting their their bets out there, but uh, yeah, I mean it was like betting a football game with him this week, and and he came through for people. It doesn't. Not quite as cool as when you hit that long shot, but uh, man, was he solid. Man, so let's start with Scheffler. A little anticlimactic by the end, but he had to do a lot of work on Saturday when he kind of ran into that stretch where he hits a couple bogeys and a double in the middle of his third round. How impressed were you with his ability to bounce back real time, to get himself back in position on Saturday, and then kind of slow bleed that thing out on Sunday to a pretty comfortable win? Yeah, so really impressive with him always. I mean, not as surprising these days because we've just seen him so many times now and he's so consistent. Uh, but he does, like, lead the PGA Tour in that bounce-back stat, which yep. is always a fun stat. You know, you, you make a bogey, you come back with, you know, a birdie or better. And he did that, you know, on the biggest stage. So, you know, just so impressive with how consistent he is. You know, he just is just this, like, great, um, illustration of a top athlete where he just kind of stays in the moment 
doesn't let his emotions get the best of him. Um, he's got a phenomenal caddy on the bag, and, and Ted Scott, obviously, he's got the blueprint on that place from uh, caddying with Bubba Watson and other guys. And um, They are really hard to beat out there, especially the way that Scheffler's playing right now. So, yeah, that was impressive. Just the entire week was just like, you know, such a crazy week of weather. And then, you know, obviously he had that added stress of his wife at home that she's going to give birth. And, and so, I mean, you put all that thing together, it wasn't the most climactic of Masters, that's for sure. But uh, I think in his camp, it was a pretty darn good win. Uh, maybe there's not necessarily a lesson to learn, but are we kind of over, especially with some guys that struggled to, and, or didn't make the cut of the familiarity of Augusta being an advantage when it comes to odds, because a lot of guys were getting the benefit of the doubt towards the short odds in Vegas and either hadn't played real well or haven't played well in such a long time, but advantage Augusta and familiarity when it comes to odds makers. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, advantage is all, I mean, uh, experience is always an advantage there. Um, But then obviously it's got to mesh with, form right so that's kind of always the tricky thing like if a guy has great experience but he comes in with kind of very mediocre form then you know that certainly wouldn't reflect any value in his odds um you know also we saw some first timers play really well there this week so you know i ludwig obviously comes to mind uh looks like a future masters champ right out the gates and you know a guy like adam shank never played there before and, and goes out and gets a return finish so uh, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a give and take with that, but you no, know, I agree with you. I mean, I think there, there are going to be guys that, you know, get the, the master's respect going into the week and then just, it doesn't materialize for them. And it's either because at poor form or, you know, maybe this last week got on the bat, the wrong end of a draw, you know, that's always something that's a factor, you know, you got a bad tee time, you know, or maybe, you know, as we kind of see more and more years stack up, it's like, Hey, this place isn't for them. So, uh, you got to take all those into account. Uh, uh, the next year along, along those lines level of concern for Spieth yeah Spieth uh boy he his putting's gotten back to where he kind of needed it to be and then he was you know his ball strike his driving was great in San Antonio as he said and then now his irons are just everywhere so I don't know what to think with Spieth like it, it feels more and more or less likely that he's going to get back to where he was you know five six seven years ago and and him and Michael Greller have been such a good team for such a long time. And Michael's a friend of mine. Uh, you That's know, right. you, you wonder how, how that thing's going to play out over the next year, too. They're just such a tight-knit team. But Spieth seems to be getting in his own way uh, a lot these days. And then when you look over your shoulder and you see guys like Scotty and, and other guys that are playing better than you, it just it makes your mind work double time to try to get it back. We're talking with John Rathaus. He hosts the Quiet Please podcast here on Herd Out Sports Network, also a former caddy. John, you know, so I'm, I'm watching some of your videos on Twitter as you're breaking down round by round, and, and you you put one out talking about how round three you expected to see a lot of a lot more birdies. So kind of break it down for the Brooks Kepska type of the world like me, where I only show up for majors. Um, <laughs> like, how are you evaluating that? Is it just weather condition? Is it whole play, like pin placement? Like, how are you looking at the round and being like, ah, I think we're going to see a little lower scores today. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, thanks for watching that. And, and I think people enjoyed it. I, I've really just done it for the Masters the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the pin sheet comes out, you know, the day, the morning of, you know, I'd certainly like to lean on my experience there. I don't have a ton of experience, but had one nice run there uh, back in 09. And, you know, we all know the pins there. And so I feel like I can kind of understand, you know, shot value out there a little bit. And certainly then I try to mesh that with what the wind direction is forecasted to be. Um, this week, the variable that I think I was a little bit late to the party on was just how firm the golf course was getting, mm. uh, especially after that first night's rain. So I feel like I was probably thinking there was going to be a few more birdies and eagles as the week unfolded. We saw more of that on Sunday, but the wind and the firm conditions just kind of limited that. But it's a fun exercise for me um, just to kind of know as a caddy kind of, hey, these are the ones where these guys are kind of yellow light, red light sort of situation. And these are ones where it's like you got to step on the gas. So I felt like I did a pretty good job evaluating it. And uh, I mean, certainly, I think as people start to do some live betting more and more or hole by hole betting, those sorts of things are insights that you know people certainly would appreciate. Speaking on stepping on the gas a little bit, Colin Morikawa talked about 
how he felt the need to get a little more aggressive. He called it greedy in that final round because of the position Scheffler was putting him in. Did you think he actually made a misstep there or that he just didn't execute the shots he needed to? You can start with eight, yeah, I, obviously, with the triple. Yeah, yeah, the the execution certainly wasn't there for him. I think when I watched that tournament year after year, I think you guys probably agree with me, and they say, you know, hey, the Masters didn't start until the second nine on Sunday. And you really see that there's so many birdie opportunities on, on, on the second nine that if you can kind of just kind of maintain touch with the leader, you know, going to the turn, even if you're three or four back, you know, sometimes you need some gifts from that leader. And nobody was getting any gifts from Scotty this last week. Uh, but you're still in the tournament. So I think these guys are kind of maintaining their game plan, maintaining discipline. And then they would start to kind of push it a little bit more when they get on that stretch on like 12, 13, 14, 15. And what happened yesterday, I felt like, is that timely birdie by Scott on on number nine, right? And then Ludwig made that sick birdie putt from the second shelf or the top shelf down to there. So he kind of put himself in the mix. Um, but then right there on like 10 and 11, and then Max on 12 is when the guys kind of like just faltered, you know, when they just, if they could have made pars there, they would have still been in touch to be able to make that move. And Ludwig kind of did a little bit. Um, but yeah, Morikawa looked like he kind of uh, was a little bit more deflated sooner than those other two, at least. And uh, it didn't make for as exciting of a last, you know, seven holes, I'd say. JR, I didn't want to be um, disrespectful, but I asked Ravi in the, the segment right to start the show <clears throat> with the reverence and the, the respect that we give Scheffler. Does it seem... Would you have guessed that he's, and I say only, and I know what I'm saying because it's a lot, but it's at Augusta twice, but we've seen some other runs over a three-year span where guys have won more majors. Is it his consistency of the top tens that gets us to talk with the level of respect that we do? Because we've seen greater stretch runs, maybe not in the totality of career starts and, and consistency. Is that the difference? Or are you still in wait and see mode for Scheffler because you have seen at least some glimpses of this before? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't think I'm in really in wait and see mode with him anymore. I think, you know, when he goes out and like proves his first major of the year, when he's the odds on favorite, as you mentioned, like by a wide margin coming in, like not a very attractive bet. Uh, and he goes out and he closes the door. Like, uh, yeah, I think, man, he can really pile them up going forward hmm. this year. I mean, I saw someone threw 80 to 1 to win the Grand Slam on him. Now, hmm. like, 80 you know, to 1. Now oh, wow, already. 80 huh? to 1 is what I saw. So, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, people, you know, it, he's never going to match Tiger. Nobody will ever match Tiger because Tiger brings that extra bit of uh, enjoyment in watching him. Tons of golf respect for Scotty, the way he goes about it. Like, he's very true to himself. Mm -hmm. Not maybe as exciting of a guy to watch out there, at least in terms of his demeanor. I joke so with I Ravi that he makes from. that he makes Dustin Johnson look loosey-goosey with his stroll. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just cooler yeah, than a fan, isn't he? Like, it's just like, huh. Yeah. He's super cool, and he's super consistent. And like I said earlier, with Ted Scott on the back, like those guys are pretty hard to beat because they're just not going to make mistakes. And the last thing I was going to say when I kind of heard his press conference afterwards is that I think DB, you would really uh, agree with this. Is this guy hates losing. Yep. And when you've got good players that yep. hate losing, that's the <laughs> recipe for a big-time champion. Preach. John, great stuff. We appreciate it. I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, John. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. That's John Rathaus from the Quiet Please podcast. That's the show for the day. We'll be back tomorrow.